ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, boys and girls, babies and citizens, babies and citizens, this joy to the world, this joy to the world, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, boys and girls, babies and citizens, this joy to the world. I bring a message of the truth amidst a world full of lies. I graduated from learning lies to speak the truth. Indoctrinated to be too blind to see the proof. I once was lost, but now I'm found, so I shine light. And everywhere I go is darkness, so I shine bright. Say in their heart. Let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps us for the appointed weeks of the harvest. That's Jeremiah 524, and you're watching Uncommon Ground. I'm Wes with an S, and this is episode 30, Seasons, Tides, and Time Zones. It's crazy to think we've done this many shows, right? I remember when I first started binge-watching everything on a channel a few years ago and couldn't get enough of this understanding this guy was putting forth, right? That channel was Kingdom in Context. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show, Sean Griffin. Hey, what's up, Wes? Thanks for having me back. Really, this is so much fun. We get to talk about tides and seasons and time zones. And uh, I think this week... Um, yeah, I just I think uh, this is an episode a lot of people really waited for in season one, but we just didn't. We had so much to get to in season one, you know, right out the gate uh, that we were glad to finally get to it here in season two. So what are we uh, five episodes in four episodes into season two? So it is an honor to be able to still be doing this. Looks like we had a lot of people in the live chat that are glad to see us back. So, yeah, I'm just honored that everyone is excited for the show. Me too. Yeah, it's always a blast to do this with you, dude. And uh, I just praise God that we have the platform and the opportunity to be able to share God's truths with so many people because the responses have been so uplifting and such a huge blessing, right? Nothing has been more fulfilling to me than sharing God's truth. And uh, so I just thank you for being here, bro. And I want to yeah. um, send my special appreciation to everyone who continues to watch these shows we put together. And we love you guys. We just want to say shalom and howdy to a few people in the chat who all is here. Uh, I'll say what's up to James Apple. Country Dad is here, Gilead 10. We got his name, Kelly Lutz. GR Cleave is in the house. Miss Marsha, Shalom. AC and Simply Lexi. You see anybody else, Sean? You want to say what's up to? Yeah, uh, Wesley Rains is back. AC, Sherry Boatwright, um, Kelly Lutz, Tracy Jones is here. Good to see you again. Carrie M, the prodigal son's back. Hector Search for Truth. I think hopefully he'll find it here tonight. Uh, Simply Lexi is here. Rich P is on Eads, Arc Builder CCMC. Amani Roy, welcome everyone. Yep, yep. All the all the fam. So glad y'all are here. Thank you for being here. Much love. That being said, you know, we want to thank you guys, all of you who have donated to receive a season one USB flash drive. Right. Do you have a, a slide you could pull up? Yeah, let's do this real quick. Oh, uh, wait, actually, well, there was a couple comments I wanted to check out first, I think, before we do that. Yeah, one second here. No yeah, we had a couple of comments we want to highlight. Uh, one's from Truth in Plain Sight from episode 29, which is two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said this entire series is legendary, guys. It means so much. Thanks, Unfair Funfair. We appreciate that. I feel the same just about like just uh, what we've been able to accomplish and, and put forth for everybody to be able to understand. It's It's been legendary for me to experience as well. So <laughs> I uh, I love it. But yeah. Aisha Fay says Ashley Webster was one was the one making maps when I was in the Flat Earth Cosmology crew eight years ago or so. I was so far behind Rob Skiba at that time. I was front and center, shoulder to shoulder with the Skiba man, and I had no idea the resource at my fingertips. I can't tell you how I anticipate the resurrection since discovering Sean Griffin, you and the Torah community at large. Thank you. And that Appreciate means a lot. That. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's funny they should mention Ashley Webster. Because I saw that name a lot um, coming into, you know, the, the communities and the online groups that we've had that would discuss these topics. And that name, Ashley Webster, would pop up a lot on certain like images and maps and memes, really. And so we'll actually be looking at a couple of the um, the maps, I think, that she's put together tonight in this presentation as well. So I don't know who she is, but that's a yeah. popular name. <laughs> Hope maybe no relation or some relation to Webster's Dictionary. Who knows? <laughs> you never know. <laughs> but she's also making resources. Yep. We also have, uh, speaking of resources, we have the flash drives. We have the stickers. And uh, we actually have Tyler Porter in the in the crowd tonight saying he's loving his flash drive and stickers. Yes. So glad you got him, brother. 
yeah, I'm happy to to make sure that you got that. We want to say a huge thank you to all of you who have d- donated to uh, to receive a season one USB. Several have already, you know, received theirs. And if you've ordered yours, maybe from like Canada, like one of our viewers did, then it should be there anytime now. As I have gotten completely caught up on those, everybody has had them at least shipped out. So check those out. That's right. Yeah, links in the description as well. If you'd like a sticker, um, yeah, signed and, and wrote something on these stickers that are attached to the USB drive for like a label, but you also get a blank sticker too, just so you know. Nice. And of course, you got to pick up some merch. Yeah. <laughs> Another big thank you to everyone who supports the cause, right? By wearing their gear from the Uncommon Ground Teespring store. Look at these beautiful people, right? Just glowing in our shirts. <laughs> Links in the description, uh, again, of this video below for you guys to check out those things. So you can get your USB dri- drive in the, the merch as well. Nope, oh, I missed one. And then oh. we got, uh, these These are really fun shirts right here. Yeah, yeah. I like that. I like to, to see people wearing those. Yep. Yeah. My lovely girlfriend being the model for us. <laughs> On the left, on the left, yeah, right? yeah. Let's <laughs> make sure. Okay. And, and Mark Barr, Mark, Mark Barr was a, was a good brother of Joshua Johnson as well. Yeah, yes, sir. Family member there. But that being said, um, and we have come to the episode right where we need to break some down, uh, some things down for you guys a little further for our audience. You know, so let's just say some of these concepts are pretty new to you, and you're now entertaining the idea. That the biblical enclosed model of creation is true, you may be asking, how does it work though? You know, because for so long we've been taught the same standardized answers for the causes of things like the seasons, tides, and time zones. Yeah. But if the earth is a geocentric and stationary plane, then what practical processes are really resulting in these mechanisms of, ma- of nature, right? I believe we can give a reasonable explanation for them and discuss some speculations too. But what do you think, Sean? Uh, what's the specific question? I was looking at oh, some of the videos. You're good. Play. Yeah, Sorry. you're good. This is going to be the uh, the teaser. I was just saying. I think we can give an, a, a good explanation for the guys and and the, the gals is checking out. You, this is the one you sent titled "Next Time." Yeah, yeah, that one. Okay. Sorry you. about that. Yeah, no worries. That's the trailer. All right, I'll play that in one second. Thank you, please, sir. I appreciate it. Something got a hold of me, lying in a bed of thieves. What is reality? Standing here frozen, truth is showing, and I know now nothing is as it seems. 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 What is reality? Let's get into it tonight. Specifically about, like I said, these mechanical processes of so uh, the, of these nature phenomenons that we call the seasons and so on. We'll start with the seasons, but uh, let's look at some scripture if you wouldn't mind first. I'll read if you don't mind. Genesis 1, 14 through 15 says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years and let them be for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so check out episode one sky is the limit. We're going to break down for you what the firmament of the heavens, plural. There's seven of them, right? Shalom from under the seven domes. So you're on mute, brother. Just like the T-shirt, the scriptures and like all the first century believers understood the shape of creation we covered that in uh the first episode of this season just real quick before we move too far i wanted to say thank you to following Yahuwah and yahusha yahushua um uh, yashua sorry i think i said that right um but thank you so much for the super sticker appreciate that much love we do appreciate that yeah but yeah i just wanted to point out there it said that for the seasons right these were appointed mm-hmm. some say you know moedim is the hebrew word there but it, it can also mean you know appointed times and it can also envelop the seasons as they progress through the year that's right so does that mean just the moon or the sun and all and the stars too 
It says the sun and the moon. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the not lights, just not just the moon. Stars. Just want to make sure. Right. Okay. Right. All right. <laughs> Julius two nine. God appointed the sun to be a great sign um, on the earth for days and for sabbaths and for months and for feasts and for years and for sabbaths of years and for jubilees and for all seasons of the years. Nice. Okay. So for seasons of the years, the sun is a great sign. And so I think we'll we'll see, you know, some of that going on in, in the biblical truth of these things. But we also have the the occult, <laughs> unfortunately, the uh, the mainstream narrative of the so-called science establishments. We call them scientism sometimes because it's really just a religion based on faith. But they also deem that the sun is involved in the causes of the seasons. Right. Right. Yeah. They where they. They impose it is, is probably a good way to say that, right? And they, just they impose it way. without any way to test it. And they'll just say, you know, because of the axis, axial tilt of the earth, you know, it causes you to be at a different angle of degree, but yet they ignore the actual revolution of the earth, supposedly in their model around the fireball, gaseous fireball of the sun. Where, whereas at parts of that re uh, revolution, we would come 3 million miles closer, I think is the average mm -hmm. estimate. We'll and, go through uh, it in the slides. Yeah. So it's just a little teaser for later, I guess. But, <laughs> yeah. It's crazy that they think uh, what they do claim and what they impose into their model that they want people to believe without testing it. Exactly. Yep. They say there's an elliptical orbit going on. So the orbit around the sun that they've imposed is, is not as perfect circle. But yeah, we'll break that down some further in some of the next slides. But we want to also show you guys that from even as far back as Enoch, right, the seventh from Adam, um, from the Richard Lawrence tr uh, translation here of Enoch chapter 81, verse 11, he's talking about four conductors of them first enter who separate the four quarters of the year after these 12 conductors of their classes who separate the months and the year into 364 days with the leaders of a thousand who distinguish between the days as well as between the four additional ones which as conductors divide the four quarters of the year. So we've known all our lives growing up. It's taught to us in school that there's, you know, what is it? Spring, summer, fall, and winter. Yep. And so there's four, you know, separations yep. here that yep. even, even the word of God talks about. That's because right. Because we do conclude that Enoch is Holy Spirit inspired scripture as we've covered it before. Is. We had someone in the in the crowd real quick, Zyar Cleave, he was uh, saying he thinks it's fascinating that the moon in the book of Enoch, it said that the moon has uh, four different names that it goes by. And he's speculating, is that in alignment with the four different seasons? Uh, and I used to think that, too, but I don't know. It could be. But the sun only has two names, not four, you know, and the sun goes through six gates. So I just I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to discern. But um, it is interesting that consistently in Enoch and Jubilees, there is, and in and the rest of the canon, there is the four seasons of the year, the four quarters of the year. There is, right. And we also have mentioned here that there's 12 conductors of the classes, of their classes, who separate the months. And this isn't the only example in both Enoch, we got Jubilees, there's one even in Revelation. Um, there's several examples even in the canon that discuss how there's 12 months in, in a year. <laughs> contrary to what gets taught often but this right. is you know this is a, another topic the calendar discussion would be in a whole another episode in itself if we even did one but i just think <laughs> it's interesting there that there's 364 days contrary to what we're taught about the 365 day calendar okay <laughs> westways if we ever do a calendar episode <laughs> we just need to title that one all gas no brakes because <laughs> <laughs> we're good flying off the cliff in an atv right right yeah <laughs> i've seen it and but uh yeah four separations of the year 364 days 12 months and then you got it diagrammed up, up here at the top spring summer fall winter very very nice and the jubilees also tries to mention the same concept as well in chapter six and uh, i think this is one of the only places in the book of jubilees that it starts to address the 364 day calendar year right and the divisions of the year um do you want me to read this one real quick please here in jubilee 6 23 through 24 and on the new moon of the first month, and on the new moon of the fourth month, and on the new moon of the seventh month, and on the new moon of the tenth month, are the days of remembrance, and the days of the seasons, and the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever, and Noah ordained them for himself as feasts for the generations forever, so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. Interesting. It is. Yeah, so four divisions of the year again, and he's even got a celebration. Um 
you know, designated for the beginning of each of these seasons as they are separated. That's right. I think that's cool because uh, these are one, these are celebrations that are, are called the new moon in most translations. Pretty much all the translations are calling them the new moon. We've reached the conclusion that it's, uh, it, it, there could be a better translation, right? A, a new head month. Head of the month. Head yeah. of the month. Day of yeah. remembrance, we tend to call it. But yeah, yeah. not, we haven't um, arrived because at the It would Go be ahead. the marker of that 91st intercalary day there every 91 days. Yeah. Yeah. That Jubilees or Enoch expounds upon. Exactly. Yeah. And if you were to wait for a new moon cycle to begin these, mm -hmm. you don't have an even four month, you know, um, you don't have an even four separations within a 364 day time period because That's the right. moon actually has 10 less days in its cycle, which is why there's 13 new moons of the actual new moon phase every two and a half to three years. They have 13 new moons in a year. Because the new the moon has a, its cycles are shorter than than the sun, so you can't just rely on one piece of the creation to to do it all for you, right? But calendar episode would be another one for sure. Just wanted to point out there that there's four separations because the Father designed the seasons. It's beautiful, it really is. And I, I like your graphic up here. You've got the red lines at the first, fourth, uh, seventh, and then tenth month, just to separate. Um, it's just to help people be reminded that these would be the considered the, the, the those new month observations and those head of the months. Mm -hmm. uh, man, I really wish I would have thought of this ahead of time so I could start playing uh, Bone Thugs in Harmony. It's the first of the month. <laughs> wake up, wake up. First and the fourth and the seventh and the tenth of the year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hit that crazy bone on them. <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, just to remind someone should remix that and uh, make it about the new moons. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. No, I say it's just right? actually the video would be hilarious because we know it getting off the boat, just dancing and, you know, and all the animals. And it's, yeah. Anyway. As he's, as he... <laughs> Isaiah 66 uh, even tells us that these new moon celebrations, new month yep. celebrations will be kept in the kingdom. Isaiah 66, 23, right? right. From Sabbath to yeah. Sabbath, new moon to new moon. All, all, all of mankind, it says, will come and worship before the Lord. Yeah, because like Jeremiah 33, the father reminds us that uh, the sun and the moon are in an eternal covenant with him, right? Mm -hmm. So they're never going away. They're never going to be destroyed. They're always going to be in the creation model he made. So it'd be natural that the seasons would also be a part of that as well. And I think this is the reminder in the covenant moment with Noah in Genesis chapter nine or Genesis chapter eight uh, verses 19 through 22, where Noah does, you know, the, the Shavuot moment. Mm -hmm. And then it is reminded to him that uh, the seasons, spring, cold, hot, and you know, they, they'll never go away, that they'll be forever and eternal. So, right. And they even yeah. observe these things, the beginning of every season, these celebrations called the new moon celebration, they're even observed in heaven yeah. with the angels above the firmament. Yeah, it's beautiful. So it's cool stuff. Worth a look. Check it out. Check it into it. There's lots of rest days and holy convocation that the Father has set up for uh, the observation of, of celebrations for his people. Yeah. He's a good God. Yes, he Oops. is. Hang on a second. Let me see if I can get this you made right. Maybe disappear. That's all right. Would you read this one? I must decrease and you must increase. All right. So <laughs> this is a, uh, we just try to show you a little, this is what the world teaches, right? This is what we've been taught growing up from government sponsored. Uh, NASA used to be a government organization as part of the military, but they're supposedly private guys. It's just for show. They're still completely operated and ran by the, the government. They literally get $22 billion a year from government funding from your taxpayer money to show you things like this that are unobservable, that are actually not evidentiary. Right. Mm -hmm. So, Therefore, this graphic we're showing you would be considered propaganda, yeah. right, to a different religious belief that they're pushing. So this is what they show us as far as why the actual pole of the tilt of the earth matters to seasons. And it, they try to tell us that Earth's axis is an imaginary pole going right through the center of the earth from top to bottom. Earth has seasons because its axis doesn't stand up straight. And it just coincidentally stands up at, you know, 23.6 degrees out of 90. 23.4 and 23. used to when you would check it out when you would look or google search up what is the degree of the axis of earth's yeah. tilt it would say 23.4 but yeah. we've been telling so many of us have been telling everybody that it will hey if you subtract 23.4 from a right angle it's 66.6 .6. I, I i don't know if that's the reason why they've changed it now but if you if you google it now it says 23.5 so i guess it's just that procession of the equinox that you know every 25,000 years it does a little wobble which yeah, nobody can observe yeah. either. <laughs> well, you know, people are getting fatter. So. Okay, that's probably yeah. it. 
I can relate. All right. Uh, yeah, that, that supposed <laughs> bulge that's supposed to be at the equator that's not there. Earth is yeah. Earth is gaining weight. It's pear shapedness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else do we got here? So yeah, they say that the seasons exist because of this tilt. Um, however, sometimes it is the North Pole tilting towards the sun around June, and sometimes it is the South Pole tilting towards the sun around December. It is summer in June in the northern hemisphere because the sun's rays hit that part of Earth more directly than at any other time of the year. It is winter in December in the northern hemisphere because that is when the South Pole's turn to be that, that is when it is the South Pole's turn to be tilted toward the sun. So this is NASA.gov quote straight from their websites where they're they're trying to explain what causes these seasons in their in their model but if you'd go on to the next one they're going to give you a little more elaboration on how this is this is working because earth's lopsided orbit right go ahead and read this if you would mm, so earth they say earth's lopsided orbit which is earth's perihelion it means the point closest to the sun is uh, 91 million 400 thousand miles from the sun and then earth's aphelion is the point farthest from the sun would be 94 thousand 94 million 500 thousand miles from the sun an approximate difference of 3.1 million. While that is a difference of over 3 million miles relative to the entire distance, it isn't much. Okay, so I get extra sunburned when I hike up to 9,000 feet and go digging for crystals with my wife because we're closer to the sun. But yet, if I'm not, if I'm 3 million miles closer, suddenly it doesn't matter. Is that what they're telling me? That is, what, yeah, exactly. Because of this tilt in the direct you know, sunlight, this is going to be causing more of a difference than the 3 million miles. So it will we'll illustrate it a little bit more if you'll see, because yeah, like you tease here at the beginning of the episode is that there is a, a strange phenomenon going on with what they say is happening during summer in the North hemisphere, so-called hemisphere, right? And then when it's summer in the Southern hemisphere, there's a strange thing going on, but we'll illustrate it on the next slide if you would. You remember how uh, Icarus flew too close to the sun in Greek mythology and got his wings burnt? I've That'd heard be of a hilarious meme. You just see this at the top, and then at the bottom is Icarus just being like. Do you, do you remember uh, back in the day there was a cartoon on Cartoon Network, and it was a uh, it was an old timey kind of superhero cartoon. I say old timey, but like from the seventies or eighties, maybe it was Birdman. Birdman. Yeah, he actually that was a retelling of the Icarus because he would go up to yeah. the sun to get his his energy right. Yeah, those 70s Hanna Barbera cartoons were wild, man. Yeah. All right. So um this do you want this one? Sure, yeah. And believe it or not, Aphelion, when Earth is farthest from the sun, occurs in July. When we're furthest from the sun in July for us in the north, it's summer, all right? But that's when we're furthest from the sun, NASA says. And uh per perihelion, when we are closest, occurs in January. You know, it's cooler in January winter time for most of the north right. but we're closest to the sun they say for those of us who live in the northern hemisphere where it's summer in july and winter in january that seems backwards doesn't it <laughs> that just goes to prove that earth's distance from the sun is not the cause of seasons there it is nasa.gov yet in the same breath they will tell you mm -hmm. that because there's more direct sunlight on the tilt I'm just I'm blown away. It's hard to even try to explain the amount of like fallacy that's going on here because they say that, that the Earth's distance from the sun makes no difference. But right. this tilt does make a difference. <laughs> that's what's nuts because so the North the tilt but, being like, you know, if, if their circumference, if their radius of the Earth is, you know, three point nine thousand miles, if that's correct, um, then that means that that 23 degree tilt is going to be putting a small portion of that radius of landmass. A little bit closer right and if it's you know just what what do we say what maybe a thousand miles closer at most out of four, out of approximate four thousand mile radius so like that makes no sense so suddenly three three million miles doesn't matter as you literally suppose you're spinning in a revolution closer to the body of the sun but just because you're tilted a thousand miles closer that suddenly matters right so, exactly okay okay so, so we're on the breaking point we're on the perfect edge to the perfect crust crust of the revolutionary point to where just a thousand more miles and suddenly the heat matters 
and sunlight does because of more direct sunlight as opposed to the indirect amount of sunlight that it gets when it's tilted to the few thousand yeah. you know a few thousand miles difference so here's an illustration here i even used a protractor to try to get that 23.4 <laughs> degree tilt nice. going on but uh yeah north of the equator it's summer south of the equator it's winter when you're uh we're furthest away from the sun uh, at this point in time here based on this illustration and uh, yeah, you can just see the the rays of the sun all coming in perpendicular, like the the model assumes, which is the opposite of what we observe. <laughs> yeah, and of course, Anne McKenzie is asking a, a good question because she's saying, "Isn't the Earth shaped like a pear?" Because that's what they've told us, right? The yeah, the that's Neil deGrasse Tyson is known for that, and then he'll he'll back backtrack by saying, "But if you were a, a cosmic giant, the." The difference wouldn't it would still feel smoother than a cue ball to you because it the difference isn't even noticeable which is why all the images you see of earth from space are perfect spheres and it doesn't mm. look sphere you know pear-shaped at all they just say that there's a bulge yeah it's a little chubby below the equator i think we should all just as a fun uh as a fun homework this week for the viewer when you go to the grocery store just take the labels for the oranges and and put them under the pears <laughs> And just let everyone buy some, uh, and then switch the pairs to the oranges. That way, they can buy some, some completely round pairs. It'd be great. <laughs> it's great. silly, isn't it? Yeah, they're just throwing out all kinds of wackiness. And I wanted to point out here that they say this tilt is constant, um, regardless of which side of the sun. Right, you're on one side of the sun on this six months, and then in the other side of the six months, they say or on the other six months of the year, they say you're on the other side of the sun, but that tilt remains constant according to their right. model. So it that's just to illustrate here for you. That's why uh, they this is why they say the seasons are caused just based on this tilt, mm. because you're tilted away and then you're tilted towards the sun on opposite sides of it, different times of the year. But it's it's really kind of ludicrous the more you think of, of it. And we got a quote, I think, that'll kind of help point out some of that Ill ridiculousness. <laughs> this is from an author named E. Eschini. In, in 1940, they wrote a book called Foundations of Many Generations. And in it, they said, the supposition that the seasons are caused by the Earth's annual motion around the sun at a mean distance of 92,500,000 miles of miles is, is grotesque, right? According to the Piazzi, uh, the size of the sun is in proportion to the Earth as 329,360 to 1. The diameter exceeds that of the Earth 112 times. So the Earth appears, as Biot says, by this statement, a mere grain of sand as compared to the sun. This enormous expanse of light focused on a rotating grain of sand at the distance of 93 million millions of miles would cause the same season throughout it. So this is funny because we get accused all the time. If Earth were, you know, not a ball, if Earth were a plane, yeah. then you'd have the same season. You'd have daylight all day long. You'd have seasons the same all year long. When <laughs> the reality is, if if the Earth, the Sun were as big as they say it is, with the Earth as tiny as they say it is, in compared to the Sun, you're just getting this massive amount of of light shed on this tiny grain of sand in comparison all year long and there should be no difference in season. Is it my internet? No, I'm here. You froze a little bit though. Can you hear me? My check. Hello, yeah, I'm here. Still there? Yeah, I'm here. Check, check. We're back. Hey, yeah. it wouldn't be an episode if it didn't happen once. <laughs> it wouldn't. <laughs> That's okay. That's I'm bad. Here, By the time they finally catch on all the keywords we've said so far, somebody with blue hair at YouTube finally decides to start paying attention. <laughs> somebody with blue hair. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yep, that's what they do. But we're live still. Can you hear me, though? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that they had some little notes on their title page, right? This is the chapters of that book. It's number one was Scripture versus the Fable of the Revolving Earth. Number two is the policy, the policy of Constantine and its decline. Number three was How Are the Dead Raised Up and With What Body Do They Come? And number four is To the Jews. And just so much of this sounds like episodes of Uncommon Ground. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. All right, so we've said this in the past, but we have to apparently announce it again because people in the live chat are asking, uh, saying that we need better Wi-Fi. Guys, I literally pay for the most expensive Wi-Fi possible and available. I get one gig of speed. I get, uh, was it 400 megabytes upload? 
um, and 900 download. So it's the most expensive that is offered uh, according to Spectrum in my area. So um, this is just, it just happens every time we do a show here at the Uncommon Ground, regardless of the internet. <laughs> yeah, with the same setup that you do other shows with and nothing happens wrong. <laughs> it never, it never happens on my other broadcasts, or at least not con as consistently as it does every single time we do Uncommon Ground. So strange. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's pretty amazing. How are the... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it looks like this guy, I don't know what kind of paper this was, but it looks like he was clearly questioning the same things we were, except, except you know, maybe number four. I don't know exactly what that means. But uh, in 1940, he's clearly asking some of the same questions. He was uh, evangelizing. Oh, to the Jews? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Sounds like yep. a, a good hearted man. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So we got a little bit of humor, a little bit of humor to load up for you guys. So y'all can kind of visualize the the absurdities of what is taught about the, the commonly taught model and how the seasons are caused as a result. But you got that loaded up, brother? Ready to go. Let's play it for the people. Mine's not working. Just tilt the marshmallow, Charlie. It's still not working. No, Charlie, tilt it 23.5 degrees. Oh, yeah. There you go. Warning. Ball Earth Logic. Ball Earth Logic is highly contagious. If you encounter Ball Earth Logic, immediately research Flat Earth. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> Side effects. Side effects may include dizziness, spinning, terrible things. I don't know. <laughs> Losing your ability to think critically. There it is. That's a good yeah. one. Yeah. Well, all I know is I can't lean back in my chair now because I might hit that 23.4 degree and catch on fire. Spontaneous combust. It's turning yeah. into Super Saiyan. <laughs> Going Broly in here. I love it. Yeah, a little bit of humor there. And they named him Charlie. Sure. I love it. Ouch, Charlie. Charlie. Hello, Charlie. <laughs> you burnt me, Charlie. <laughs> All right. So just putting this out there for them flat earthers. Might as well go ahead and say it. It's, but uh, this is the kind of memes that we get, right? The kind of stuff that gets shown to us when we're trying to explain our, our biblical worldview on right. what God said he created. We get these kind it's of things. A, it's not a flat disk in space. It's not a, a flat uh, stationary land that's infinite with some sort of flat firmament above. That's not what's described by the creator. No. Nope. In the enclosed world model, we have a small and local sun. As we discussed in several episodes last year, right? We had episode two, geocentricity, no sphericity was the episode two of Uncommon Ground. Definitely check that out to help build a foundation for this show, as well as episode seven, right? The greater light as we covered the sun in the firmament. We discussed it in some more detail, but uh, we'll kind of be reviewing a few of those aspects tonight with this. So, yeah, they, they would like to assume that in our model that the sun is still the same size as heliocentrism says it is, but we would disagree. So yeah, we would. They make false assumptions. And so try to impose. Them. I think one of the biggest false assumptions that's made is that the light from the sun is infinite, and that's actually been uh, measurably and observably proven to be false. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So very much like your street light in your neighborhood, you're not going to be able to see that from 30 neighborhoods over in the next town. Right. You're not going to see the street light that illuminates your local, you know, your porch or your your street outside by your mailbox it's it's not gonna also illuminate the mailbox three cities over so in a yep. similar fashion you have a localized illuminating light source yeah with the sun would you read these well sure sure this is talking about which model best represents these descriptions of the sun as we perceive it on the earth so enoch 72 35 says the sun has completed its beginnings and a second time goes around from these beginnings and i would encourage the viewer to look towards the model on the right, the top right hand side of the screen. That's a top down view of the sun circling overhead, the flat stationary dome enclosed earth of creation. Ecclesiastes 1.5 says also the sun rises and the sun sets and hastening to its place, it rises there again. Um, similar to Psalm 45, Psalm 19, four and six, where it says he's placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, it rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It's rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other and end of them. And real quick, I'll just make a quick stop right here because both Ecclesiastes 1.5 and Psalm 19.4 and 6 both use the same language 
that we see um, Enoch 71 through 82 use about the sun rising and setting. But if you actually look in the Greek and the Hebrew in Psalm 19, it's specifically a word that doesn't mean that it's rising like uh, horizontally or excuse me, vertically. It's the going forth. So it means it's going from one place to another across the sky. Common vernacular throughout translated history of the English language has used to, you know, this idea of rising and setting, but it was never meant to be literally vertically rising. Its original word is a going forth from one place to another overhead. Like coming out or through a gate. Even That's maybe. right. Yeah. yeah. And you did a great breakdown of that in episode seven, the greater light of, of last season. So uh, y'all check that out for a, a fuller understanding on that one. You showed the Hebrew word and everything. Yeah. And then in second or excuse me, first address four, verse 34 says the earth is vast and heaven is high and the sun is swift in its course for it makes the circuit of the heavens and returns to its place in one day. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful, right? So just like in Psalm 19, talking about running its course, well, it, it's defined as a circuit, both there and in First Ezra 4. So a circuit is someplace that starts at its beginnings and then comes back to that same place. And that's that's what it's talking about doing in one day. That's right. Yeah. So it's and basically, we, I guess it's saying the sun moves and not the earth, Wes. It is. That's right. And yeah, we would hold that the Most High God who inspired his prophets to write these words knows what he made and he would not use incorrect or just you know wrong language to describe his own creation he would not give his prophets and scribes incorrect information to then convey to the people you know that that just would not make sense but uh what in reality the relation between the sun and the earth is geocentric not heliocentric the sun's annual journey from tropic to tropic solstice to solstice solstice is what determines the length and character of days nights and seasons and this is why equatorial regions experience almost year-round summer and heat while latitudes higher uh, latitudes north and especially south is experience more distinct seasons with harsh okay. winters right but we'll have more on that here in a second. What was the next slide? And just real quick, Wes, uh, we have someone in the audience asking about first Esdras. And so just for you guys, just to let you know that the Greek formatting of that, so it's basically what they've done with the book of Ezra would be considered uh, first and second Esdras. It depends on where you found the manuscript you're going off of, but it, some, some manuscripts or Bibles collections in the past, there's four different Esdras. Mm -hmm. And first and second became the commonly known book of Ezra in the canon. And then third and fourth became what we generically refer to as second Ezra's. But some people also call second Ezra's, which is a combination of two books. They'll refer to it as what we have here tonight with first Ezra's 434. So it, it can be a little you, bit. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just um, I think. Based on like, for instance, what the Sefer calls them, this mm -hmm. would be third Esdras, first Esdras. That's would what be I was third. trying to say. Okay, okay. okay. So yeah, what what some people have called third and fourth Esdras, other people call second Esdras, but mm -hmm. within that collection is what we're referring to tonight in the first Esdras four, verse thirty four. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated. Sorry, it is. It really <laughs> is. It's it's a tricky one because of the different translations and how right. they got named to different volumes. Yeah, the same yeah. thing goes with like the different translations and versions of Enoch, right? You'll have different chapter numbers and different wordings and stuff. So copyrights and a number of things can go into that to cause those differences. But yeah, most of them are going to be Richard Lawrence from Enoch tonight, just because I like gate more than portal. Sure. I yeah. like the word gate. Uh, <laughs> a I little bit. Time to explain portal just means door or gate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you, Kinda Kindig, for the super sticker. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Awesome. Much love. Appreciate it. Yeah. So I wanted to uh, show you guys this map. You have this map, don't you, bro? I do. I have it as well. And it's called the New Standard Map of the World. In 1892, this was created by a guy named Alex Gleason. Alex Gleason was a, uh, I believe he was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was a, uh, he was a, a Bible believer for sure and, and was an advocate for the Sabbath at least, right? Keeping the commandments of God. And he also was a biblical earther so-called right biblical cosmologists agreed with the enclosed model of creation because he also wrote a book right he didn't just use this map as a projection thinking it's just an azimuth like distant projection of the map he also believed that this is more representative of what the earth actually looks like and he even denotes that in the the header right it says yeah. the projection of uh what is it right here oh scientifically and 
practically correct as it is. He kind of hid this in here, right? You got to look at the bottom left. Uh, can you move your, I'm sorry, right over here um, on the right side of the image and then over the red part, right? There's these little words, scientifically, yeah. there's the, and then practically correct as it is in the center, it says. So he kind of hid that in there just to let you guys know that's what he believed because it's true. <laughs> So yes, it's, uh, the Antarctic ice ring surrounds the flat oceans, which are filled with our land masses that we live on. So, and we're correct. enclosed by a firmament as described by scripture. Yeah. So a couple of things I thought was interesting about this map and projection that he's put forth was uh, the things at the bottom left and the bottom right corner of the very, you know, of the whole map of the whole printout. And so on the next slide, I've got those zoomed in on. Yeah. The in HD. So this is on the left side showing June 21st, what the uh, where the sun is. So if you look at the difference between the one on the left and the one on the right, because on the one on the right is December 21st at the December solstice, you see the sun is about two notches over. Do you notice that? Yeah, I was I was going to ask you about that. It does look a little bit different, doesn't it? Because, it does. well, we know why. Mm -hmm. According to Enoch, we know why. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we'll get into that. So he illustrated those. And then below each of those where it says June and December solstice, he has a little paragraph for each of those. I'd like to read that to the people and show them what this gentleman thought. Uh, if you would, go ahead. So the June solstice, he wrote, in the figures June and December, the white represents the sun's position in his respective months at noon. This shows sunlight inside the Arctic Circle for 24 hours. From June 21st, the sun moves around the tropics in a spiral circle widening every day until it reaches its destiny on the southern or outer solstice on December 21st. Nice. And then the December solstice, it says on December 21st, the sun moves round the Tropic of Capricorn and during the day lights up the southern portion of the Earth from the Arctic Circle to some portion of the Antarctic ice. There is no sunlight beyond 80 degrees south. I find that to be one of the most interesting claims on this. Yeah. Right. No sunlight. And he has that in quotations, right? There's there's, I would take that to mean that you can't see light coming directly from the sun, meaning you couldn't look up and see the sun beyond 80 degrees south, but there would still be a form of luminescence going on, right? You, yeah, what they call ambient light. Sure, sure. So yeah. you had that, and that's reminiscent of when, you know, the father on the first day, he's darkness, you know, is surrounding him. And then he said, let there be light. And this was four days before the sun and the moon were even created. He had, okay. he had created night and day. And so I'd imagine that you can see daylight from beyond 80 degrees south at, during the day, maybe, or during certain times, but you can't see the sunlight. So there would be a difference there, right? It was similar to when, you know, sun sets and sun rises uh, morning and evening. You, you do see light. The sky is lit up. You can see the light coming at you, even though you can't see the body of the sun yet. There you go. Yep. Yeah. But unknown regions of ice um, beyond 80 degrees south, right? On the 23rd of December, the sun commences his northward journey again, returning to his starting place and thus completes his seasons. Interesting. Yep. The scriptures also refer to the sun as a male and the moon as a female. That's right. Fascinating yeah. stuff. Yeshua spoke about the sun not producing her light. Correct. On the day of the Lord. The, the moon. Yeah, the, the moon, moon. Excuse me. Yeah. There you go. Yep. And uh, here's an illustration for what that gentleman, Alex Gleason, was just talking about on his map. He's talking about the, the sun circles above the Tropic of Cancer from June 21st to July 22nd. That's the red line close to the center of the map here. The sun circles above the Tropic of Capricorn from December 21st through January 22nd. That is when the time period when we would know as winter. And uh, that's the outer light blue circle there, as well as the sun circles above the equator during the fall and spring equinoxes. So they're called equinoxes because the sun is circling above the equator. So I hope that maps it out good for you guys to be able to understand and imagine where the sun is at certain times of the year yep. and how that would affect our seasons. Yep. Which is why, you know, right now we're in the red zone, the red line. Mm -hmm. So it's about to get hot. It is. Yeah. The sun is rising higher in the sky and earlier setting later, causing more warmth over the path that it circles above. Yep. It's and then a beautiful design really, because, and it, to me, I, I, you know, this is a little bit of speculation, but it makes me wonder about the actual construction of the gates that the sun goes through mm -hmm. as far as if, you know, the, um, 
just in relationship to the light that's uh, shining down, illuminating down on the land below it, if those gates are somehow constructed to where the sides of them somehow do not allow the same amount of light to escape, if I could put it like that, which is why it, it's less intense on your eyes and there's less heat coming through. You just, know, Job calls it a, like a molten looking glass, the firmament, mm -hmm. so like a mirror. So if, if uh, a looking glass mirror type substance, you know, were to have gates in it, it's quite possible that it could focus the yeah. light in certain aspects, right? Yeah. That's cool. Would you read Eskini again? Yeah, so he's back. He's back to say more and challenge the paradigm in the, in the early 20th century saying, the seasons are caused by the sun's circuit round the earth in a spiral elliptic. In the winter solstice, December 21st, the sun is vertical over the Tropic of Capricorn. Looking south from London, he appears to make a small circuit in the southern sky. During the same period, he is seen to cross the sky at almost overhead in Cape Town. Pretty sure Cape Town's in South Africa. Thus causing summer in the southern hemisphere. In the summer solstice, June 21st, the sun is vertical over the Tropic of Cancer, nearly overhead in London. While looking north from Cape Town, that would be at the bottom of the African continent in South Africa. He appears to make a small circuit in the Northern sky, causing winter in the Southern and summer in the Northern hemisphere. Very good. Yeah. We appreciate E. Skinny there in 1940s. I think that's when this book was written. I, I had to dig to, uh, to find out, right. There wasn't a lot of information on the publication of this, but yeah. Well, you know how it goes. I mean, they've been suppressing this info forever, so they sure have. Yep. They wanted to shut guys up like that. And uh, we, yeah, here's another one. This was from even earlier, 1897. Um, Rectangle was the pseudonym, pseudonym here for this author, but I believe his name was Thomas Winship. Yeah, Thomas Winship. Zetetic Cosmogony is the name of his book here. And he Wait, says, this, dude, this dude went by the name Rectangle? Yeah. <laughs> that was yes. his that was the pseudonym. That is hilarious. Maybe he meant it like in an aggressive way, like that angle got wrecked. <laughs> maybe so yeah those guys like to go by pseudonyms i guess because uh you know it's persecution this, for the truth right exactly because there was another one who was it um samuel robotham he went by parallax yeah. <laughs> he did yeah uh okay <laughs> they love their pseudonyms yep they wanted to to maintain their integrity in their professional and personal lives maybe <laughs> here i am uh, here i am laughing at the idea while wearing a fun fundamentalist shirt like i Talk about hypocrite. Yeah. <laughs> apparently we're already, we're already full circle here. So West, anyway, West plays music, you know? Yeah. There you go. That's so right. <laughs> if the earth be the globe of popular belief, the same amount of heat and cold summer and winter should be experienced at the same latitudes North and South of the equator. Right? So if you have 40 degrees North and 40 degrees South, because of the constant exposure of sunlight, you should have the same temperatures, same seasons at That's the right. same degrees difference from the, the equator. But the same number of plants and animals would be found in the same general conditions exist. Uh, that the very opposite is the case disproves the globular assumption. The great contrast between places at the same latitudes north and south of the equator is a strong argument against the received doctrine of the rotundity of the earth. Thomas Winship. <laughs> that's funny it is so we got to be reminded right that the south has perpetually frozen regions the right. north doesn't have perpetually frozen right the north has 14 of the hottest 15 temperatures of all times of isn't all that crazy time. it is on the globe 70 degrees north and 70 degrees south should be identical in climate and similar populations of animal and plant life but the north has much warmer summers, yet when it's summer in the south, it does little to change the Antarctic Circle. Um, parts of the deep south have pretty much perpetual winter, right? Whereas as far north as you go, you find birds, deers, squirrels, rabbits, insects decorated with shrubs, trees, flowers, and more. But at 70 degrees south, no plant, insect, or bird is even found at 70 degrees south, right? At 49 degrees south, only 18 species of plants exist. At 65 degrees north, 16 degrees further from the equator north, Iceland alone has 870 species of plants. <laughs> the Isle of Georgia at 54 degrees south, which is the same distance from the equator as England is in the north, where all sorts of plants exist. But when Captain Cook traveled to the Isle of Georgia, 54 degrees south, 
he's recorded to have said there was not a bush or shrub to even make a toothpick with. That's wild. It is. So also in northern Canada, um, you've got, you know, Devon Island, which apparently has uh, mushrooms on it that are also recorded by NASA as they filmed their their Mars hoax. So it's great. <laughs> Did the mushrooms pop up in a, in a Mars video? Supposedly it was uh, some people were pointing out that there was some vegetation scene in one of the photos. <laughs> we got to find that for our, our Mars episode. That'll yeah. be good. Hey, Elon's going to send 1 million people by 2050 to Mars. Get your tickets now. <laughs> They're looking for all the flat earthers. I'm sure you're going to send them up first. Digging a big ditch out back. <laughs> what did we have? Uh, I think there was some temperatures. Oh. There we go. Is that, did I go back. too far? Yeah, yeah sorry. About that. Yeah. There, there it is. So I just wanted to also show in the same theme of what I was just talking about of the differences between the same latitudes, right? The same degrees difference from the equator, right? Um, the temperatures should be the same where you are um, based on your distance from the equator. You're, it should be the same north and south. However, summer in the North Pole is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Summer in the South Pole is an average of 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Hmm. These are from NASA, by the way. This little this little chart graph is yeah. NASA says this. So winter um, in the North Pole, negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit on average. But winter in the South Pole is a negative 76 degrees Fahrenheit on average. Hmm. Quite a bit colder all year round. It is. You know, it reminds me of, um, I think it's in First Enoch chapter 21, maybe, where he talks, he's having a vision of seeing the throne of God, or maybe it's chapter 16, but he talks about how the delights of life weren't there, neither heat nor cold. And it just makes me think like in God's throne, it's just like the perfect room temperature. Yeah. You know, you just can't feel hot or cold either way. It's like the perfect room temperature. He said that. And then he also said that in the, in the, the throne room, he said that it was hot as fire and cold as ice. <laughs> so but it, but it's it's both and it's neither <laughs> right right so it's paradoxical to our our mortal minds yeah it's interesting but yeah. what's what's cool is i heard a uh, interview six or seven months back um about a guy that's that is a part of the community of people mm -hmm. that are watching and um he well I, I shouldn't say that i should say he's let me just say he's in a, in a modern adventurer and explorer and he was raising funds to go to northern uh, Northern Canada into the, into the Arctic. And he claimed that he'd already been up there a couple of times and that there's like certain routes you had to take because the military wouldn't let you go on other routes. And then there were warm spots up there. That's, that was his personal testimony. So everyone out listening, you know, go, go validate this info on your own. But that was his personal testimony that there were warm spots in the Arctic region that were extremely warm like 50 yeah. 60 degrees and he would and he knew where they were and i guess he was going to try to get there so that he could stay there overnight and it'd be easier on his travels cool yeah, yeah so it's we've heard wild. similar things from different testimonies of you know yeah. what people say about antarctica that there are some places out there These warm which, spring areas yeah yeah which we will look at what could be the cause of that here from enoch pretty quickly and yeah. I'm excited i mean about there's that. old 1950 military videos showing them flying over um warm spring ponds and vegetated areas um, in Antarctica in the 1950s. So yeah. it's very interesting. Um, yeah. I just think that all that would not be very plausible if we were tilted and if the model was as they claim it to be, where it should be on both poles at some point in the year, they should reach those negative 40 temperatures, both of them. Right. With a uniform yeah. sunlight, right? The sun, right. they don't claim that the sun has a hotter temperature coming off of the top of it than it does the bottom of it or anything weird like that. They just, they claim enough weird things as it is, but it's, it should be a uniform amount of sunlight, especially if it's said to have come in, the rays come in perpendicular, which yeah. we, we don't see, but don't what see else? It. What else is, uh, this is William Carpenter. Would you read this one, brother? From 100 sure. Proofs That the Earth is Not a Globe. Yeah, back in the late 19th century, he says, every year the sun is, a long, is as long south of the equator as he is north. And if the earth were not stretched out as it is, in fact, but turned under, as the Newtonian theory suggests, it would certainly get as intensive a share of the sun's rays south as it does north. But the southern region being, in consequence of the fact stated, far more extensive than the region north, the sun, having to complete his journey around every 24 hours, travels quicker as he goes further south from September to December. And his influence has less time in which to accumulate at any given point. 
Since then, the facts could not be as if they are if the Earth were a globe. It is a proof that the Earth is not a globe. William Carpenter, Hunter proofs that the Earth is not a globe. That was proof number 53 in his book there. And uh, yeah, I would, I would recommend for anybody to to pause that and pause all of these when you get to these uh, yeah. these slides that we do where we have these quotes, because they're really, you can contemplate on them. You can really di dissect and break down the words that they're using and they, they paint a good picture. I love these yeah. these old timey authors that they they had a, a good sense of, of language to be able to describe what they're saying. And so, um, yeah, this is he's saying the same things we were just saying about the differences of north and south and how the climate should be versus what we actually can observe and test. Contradictory yeah. to the heliocentric nonsensical globular model. So yes, I want to shout does. out to yeah, I want to shout out to uh, my house ministries. They provided you know part of this graphic here. I, I uh, spruced it up a little bit here just to show where the sun travels in six gates at its rising six gates at its setting as we see in enoch and on the left side of this image here for six months he photographed the sunset from the same spot in athens and uh yeah you get you get these tracks that it looks like the sun goes on as it's pretty if it's amazing going through a it's like it's got a lane right yeah yeah it does <laughs> it's pretty beautiful mm-hmm and let's describe that a little bit more. Yeah, read Enoch 70, chapter 72 to get a, a good grasp on that. But Enoch 71, 3 through 4 says, I beheld the gates whence the sun goes forth and the gates where the sun sets, and uh, in which gates also the moon rises and sets. And I beheld the conductors of the stars among those who precede them, six gates where we're at the rising and six gates at the setting of the sun. So um, the, the gates are described... I was trying to illustrate these things, and as I was illustrating them, we'll, we'll come to another slide here pretty quick where I was illustrating the gates for the winds, and I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, because when they say the north and the east and the south, they don't they don't seem to be talking about what we can read from our perspective on a compass. So my compass, my my inner compass is kind of spinning when I'm reading these things in Enoch, trying to figure out uh, where is the north, right, on the earth? Is it is it? Are the dead center where our compass points to, like as we understand it, or could there be a, a different? Was he speaking from a different perspective, mm -hmm. and had a different understanding? I I, I gather the latter, and so uh, we'll. Yeah, that was my theory over. when we look yeah. at Enoch seventy seven and the description of what. Yeah, that's my theory. Yeah, that he's he's seeing it from a different perspective and calling something north that we might would not. Yeah, from yeah, our he's, perspective, it's actually so, a top down view. Yeah. Um, that he's looking down on the earth from his vision right. being above the firmament. And so therefore the northern quarter of the earth, which includes the Garden of Eden, would be uh, this mostly little land masses in the center of the earth. And then the east and the west and the, or the yeah, the other four quarters would extend out equally. But it not not as in a, you slice up a pie in four quarters because no. you're looking in a circular overhead view. So that means the extended distance this is my theory anyway, without having a graphic, but the extended difference of the outer perimeters makes another quarter because it encompasses so much land as it makes that outer range. If that makes okay. any sense. Yeah, so I've I, seen you. I have I've to seen, show you. Yeah. yeah, you diagrammed that on an episode of Kingdom Cast one time, and it was really confusing for me. I got to be honest. Yeah, um, it's but... because the Enoch 77 is, is challenging for sure. Yeah. It talks about the three parts of the north. Um, and so that's why I. I would say, yes, he's looking from a top-down view, mm -hmm. looking down on the earth. And so that would make sense that the north would be in, considered the navel in the center area. Um, okay. And there's three parts of it, one of which where the Garden of Eden was. Yeah, yeah got it. Got it. I like it. Yeah. Um, I also considered, too, that if you're in the promised land, right, between the Nile and Euphrates, and you were holding a compass from there, which direction on the Azimuth equidistant map would be north? Well, from, from Israel, basically, right, north would... If you place the North Pole directly above Israel and then put Israel kind of towards the bottom of the map, then now you're looking at the, the northern section um, from a top down view as being that open area in the ocean. You, you mentioned this on a recent show where you said it, it, it would make sense if there's a land mass being hidden there because it just looks like open ocean. Well, we're going to. Oh, okay, that's what you're saying. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're not taking uh, the circumference, you're just taking uh, a straight approach a straight a uh, little more straight and i'll, I'll live straight illustrate. point through the north pole to the other side yeah, right okay. and i'll illustrate it a little bit better here on the coming slides but uh okay. this is this is a, a running theory that i have and i think we'll see a couple things in the text that can help make sense of that and possibly lend to some some validation sure. for it 
So what else do we have? No, sorry. One more. Too much. Yeah. So a lot of people may have seen these, especially on the older globes, right? We don't much have globe. Most people just don't have a, a globe sitting in their house. But if you did, especially from an older one, you would see these figure eight looking infinity sign, but it's lopsided, right? It's mm -hmm. got a small, shorter end and a, and a wider end. And this is called an analemma, right? Analemma, the sun, when photographed at the same time every day from the same point for an entire year will produce this same image. And it's a, it's a lopsided figure eight infinity symbol called an analemma. According to NASA, its shape is based on the tilt of the planet and the width of its elliptical orbit is what they call, you know, what they say causes this. But the analemma makes zero sense on a globe with equal hemispheres. It makes perfect sense on a circular plane where the outer southern circumference is bigger around than the inner circle north of the equator. That's right. So how is this lack of symmetry explained on a sphere with a constant axial tilt? It might be it might as well be a constant static tilt, right? Because they say the cycle of an axial procession uh, wobble takes 26,000 years to complete, which is unobservable. But the uh, the analemma here. And so uh, the same thing they print on the globe, like I say, if you take a photo of the sun from the same point, same uh, time every day or even every week you get this same shape in the sky if you were to compile all those images and stack them together um, but if you go to the next slide we can illustrate it a little more so here's one that's even dated right and wikipedia says in astronomy an analemma is a diagram showing the position of the sun in the sky as seen from a fixed location on earth at the same mean solar time as that position varies over the course of the year, the diagram will resemble a, a figure eight. So here on the shorter loop side, you got June 21st. On the longer end, um, longer side, you got December 25th at the tip of that there. So that just kind of goes to show the solstice, right? This is when the, the sun is doing a tightest circle around June 21st, around the north. It's doing the widest circle around June, uh, December 24th, 25th. And that's what causes this analemma. Mm. But to illustrate it even further, if you would, what was, was there one more? Yeah, okay. So here's here's somebody that has compiled and stacked those images after taking the photo from a fixed location at the same time every day, every few days or whenever. And they've, uh, well, I've also dated here to show you guys the summer solstice, June 21st at the smallest point and on the widest, longest point, that's the winter solstice, December 24th. And I would have thought that the equinox, right, the when the sun's on the equator, I would have thought that it would be the point exactly where they cross, but it's not. It's a little bit further out here. So that's mm. interesting. Interesting. But I'd like to show you guys a little time lapse, right? A little bit of a of a clip that will show you guys uh, how these can look and when people with with amazing technology of camera photo, photo photographic technology can can make these things um and they can take these pictures to where they can show the analemma as it moves across the sky and just uh give you a good visual so do you have that loaded up brother it's called an analemma it's got a name an analemma but i, I don't want to talk about analemmas right now oh.
But I, I don't want to talk about Anonymous right. I don't want to talk about Anonymous right. I don't want to talk about Anonymous right. He didn't want to talk about him right now. <laughs> Man, that last <laughs> image is beautiful with the um, making the Anonyma there with that time lapse. I mean, that's just uh, that's amazing dedication by that photographer. And um, just reminds me of uh, First Enoch chapter four, I believe it is. Um, yeah, how's that? No, ch chapter two, I think, where it talks about the, the you know, the son is um, faithful, is part of creation that follows the commandment of God, you know? Yeah. And so I think about like the shape of the analemma that it makes. It almost looks like a bow. I'm not equating it to the bow of the rainbow. I'm thinking more about a ZZ that should be tied onto you. That is your reminder to follow the commandments of God. And huh. here we have the sun making a tying fashion in the sky. I think that's fascinating. That is cool. Yeah, because the sun and the moon follow an ordinance, right? They keep covenant with each other and they have a law that they follow. And that is an interesting correlation. I wasn't making that correlation. I was also pondering the the symbol of it and how I wonder if if people created the infinity symbol, right? That that figure eight um, that we use to signify infinity. If they did that based on the analemma, or if, did God already know that we were going to use that symbol for infinity? And so He put that as a sign of like because the sun counts time, and He wants it to be known that there is eternity waiting. That's right. Yeah. I like the it's great, correlation. It's great there. foreshadow there. Uh, they, you know what I know that they didn't base it off of is the wild corkscrewing pattern of planets around the sun <laughs> shooting at millions of miles throughout the, the galaxies. So, yes, dude, because if the sun was really shooting through the galaxy at 500,000 or what do they say? Is it 500,000 miles per hour? And then the earth were shooting around it and uh, all these these speeds and directions and different movements were happening, I would imagine that Analemma would look a lot different, as well as the star trails, right? The star trails yeah. would definitely show some sort of progression through space, but they don't. Yeah. Just they're fixed circuits, just yeah. as we observe and just as I the mean, word says. Everything that's observable, it is exactly what the Bible says. The Earth is stationary, so you're on the stationary part. This, the lights in the sky move overhead, and that's why we see them moving. That's right. It's exciting. I love getting into it because it's just uh, it venerates the word of God that we already know to be true. And uh, this is a an artist. I forget his name now, but there was an artist that was proposing, you know, how in Dubai, this mega city where they have all these sultans and princes and billions and billions of dollars out there from the oil that yeah. they sell. <laughs> they have all these art exhibits and, and massive skyscrapers and projects that they were wanting to do in Dubai. Well, this guy suggested one for the Analemma exhibit that he wanted to make and uh his idea was that he makes a a observatory was a, it, he wanted it to be a domed ceiling where the analemma would then show on this domed ceiling and the sun would would pour through the holes in the ceiling <laughs> and it, it looked pretty cool he only had some concept art for it but interesting not made as far as i know not yet at least so we want to check out the Septuagint. The Septuagint version of the scriptures is something I definitely recommend everybody to dig deep in. It's it's validated the history of our faith in a lot of ways for me. And uh, yeah, there's some fascinating differences between what the Septuagint text says, Septuagint being LXX, um, which was translated mostly between the third to first centuries BC. A lot of scholars would have would say that Yeshua and the, the disciples, the apostles did have access to all of the books of the Old Testament in Greek. Right. Um, whereas so, yeah, others would, yeah, others yeah, would say scholars. that the Septuagint wasn't translated, you know, in its totality until later on. I would suggest that that it was yeah. <laughs> already done. However, the Septuagint here, like I said, third, first century BC, whereas the Masoretic text that became most of our modern translations for the Old Testament is uh, translated in the ninth century AD by rabbis and the Masoretes who mostly rejected Christ yeah. and rejected Torah and the Father, really, in favor of their own traditions, right? But nonetheless, fascinating study. Septuagint of Job 38, 24 says, and from where proceeds the frost? Or from where is the south wind dispersed over the whole world under heaven? So God is kind of asking Job these rhetorical questions, like answers to things, that uh, questions that he couldn't really know the answer uh, to, right? Rhetorical in that sense. But uh, I think if Job had the book of Enoch, he might have had an idea. What do yeah, you think? He may have. But I mean, if he had that, we don't know if he did or not. But yeah, right. because I mean, if we if we're correct about lining up Job in the in the genealogy of where he was and, and what age he was in, he would have been a contemporary somewhere around the days of Abraham. But at the same time, not 
maybe a little after, maybe in the days of uh, Isaac and Jacob. But um, there's no guarantee that, uh, you know, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob would have copied and shared the book of Enoch with Job and that part of the family of the, you know, of that lineage, lineage of Esau. So That's right. Yep. But we do find several of the same concepts addressed in both Job and Enoch because the same creator inspired both of these right. prophets and scribes, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, that's a fun question to kind of start off this segment of it, <clears throat> because when we're looking into the cycles and the systems that is uh, explained to us by the mainstream science and its institutions, they will describe the patterns of the winds and the climates and, and seasons and things um, to be affected by certain processes. Um, this one specifically, I like that they it's from a what is it? eschooltoday.com. They got like a. a <laughs> floating flat piece of land with a small local sun <laughs> but they're describing how wind is formed from the pressures that happens right the barometric pressures of our of our climate shift right the pressurized air the, which can only exist because there is a container pressurizing them the air and pressure but uh <laughs> cool over the the land the air can be cool and that causes high pressure so higher pressure means more density and the air falls and then it would move because of um, the, the law of thermodynamics. And uh, yeah, it would, the pressure would move from high to low and the, the warm air over the land. What does this say? Warm air over land, cool air over land. Yeah. So yeah. when you have the cool air, it's high pressure. It would move into low pressure, which is warmer air. Right. And, and so this circulation can cause a, flow of wind that's right yeah. yeah so that's part of it right that's part of it yeah and i think that i can't remember the scripture but there is a uh there's a passage in first enoch where it talks about um the east wind that's driven by the sun i believe cool yeah we're gonna look at all the different directions the directions of the winds here's another one where they're talking about um the land and the waters right because you have ocean mm -hmm. and and uh land and the temperatures of the air over these different parts right ocean and land can vary and so the u.s u.s energy information administration would you read what they say at the bottom there so they say that during the day air above the land heats up faster than air over water warm air over land expands and rises and heavier cooler air rushes in to take its place creating wind Okay, so if you look further enough, far enough, they even tell you that the wind can come from over the oceans, which I think is interesting considering what we're going to read in Enoch here pretty quickly. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah, you know, the, the water cycle, uh, I had a whole segment kind of planned for like rain and, and water cycle, um, but I kind of had to cut parts of it out for the sake of time. However, Ecclesiastes 11.3 does say, if the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. So we do see this, you know, in modern science, they'll tell you that rain can come from the clouds. And that's true. Um, I would propose that scripture kind of talks about chambers and storehouses in, in the heavens, firmaments. Um, yeah, it's like, where does the moisture uh, come from that is collected by in the clouds? And that, yeah, is, yeah, that's the that's the question no one ever asks. They just think that it's all through the condensation water cycle process, right. which what they try to show in the back of here, these trees in the back, the transpiration from plants evaporation of the ocean so they think that's the only place that this moisture in the air comes from which collects into the into the clouds but the bible says something different the bible does mention this process yeah but it also says something different as far as the origination and the a bigger water cycle than just clouded land but in the entire creation model right and i think one of the parts that i, I believe i had to cut it out what an, a verse in enoch talks about like a cloud that has existed from the beginning of time that's like in the firmament. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't remember that one. I, I just okay. not only think about, um, I think it's Isaiah 40. It talks about the, uh, or maybe Psalm, Psalm 33, but it talks about the, uh, the, the chambers of God uh, are, are hidden by dark clouds. So, yeah. Yeah. So he so has I'm, some eternal clouds maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, it, you know, if, if we take the scripture for what it says, uh, the layers of the firmament above us have their own, ecosystems right with water land trees clouds things like that and so yeah yeah if there's agriculture going on they would need some sort of uh rains yeah and sunlight. So basically this cycle that we're seeing on the picture here is is not unique just to the level of the ferment where we are created but it if we were created you know it the whole thing would have been patterned after what god already made for his layers above and the angels yes yeah. So, yeah that's cool and again you know, on earth <clears throat> as it is in heaven yeah 
exactly yeah. again here when they um you know modern institutions depict these cycles they they like to have a dome shape going on they do <laughs> so that happens but uh ecclesiastes 1 6 says blowing toward the south then toward the north the wind continues swirling along and i found it interesting this was right after he was discussing the circuit of the sun in the same passage right ecclesiastes 1 5 verse after he's talking about the wind uh, turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along, and on its circular courses, the wind returns. Mm -hmm. Circular, not a spherical course. That's right. <laughs> Circles are not spheres. But here in Enoch 74, would you read that? Sure. 74, 10 through 14. First Enoch says this, Uriel showed me 12 gates open for the circuit of the chariots of the sun in heaven, from which the rays of the sun shoot forth. From these proceed heat over the earth, and when they are opened in their stated seasons, excuse me, and they are opened in their stated seasons, they are they are for the winds and the spirit of the dew, when in their seasons they are opened, opened in heaven at its extremities. Twelve gates I beheld in heaven, at the extremities of the earth, through which the sun, moon, and stars, and all the works of heaven proceed at their rising and setting. Many windows also are open on the right and on the left. One window at a certain season grows extremely hot. At a certain season, one of the windows in the firmament grows extremely hot. So here's something that modern mainstream science is not discussing. Gates in a literal physical structure of a domed vaulted ceiling called heaven, mm -hmm. the firmament, right, has gates through which winds flow. And these winds can be different temperatures. I find it interesting. Here's where I had trouble trying to to diagram and illustrate these things is that it says that the same winds that are at the ends of the heaven are coming out of the same gates where the sun rises and sets. So I was trying to, to picture how the gates are over the face of the earth, how the sun can move through them. Tropic of t tropic, right? Solstice to solstice. Whereas it says that these are at the ends of the heaven where the winds also come through. So like I said, I have had a tough time trying to figure out how to illustrate them, but I did the best I could. Okay. Yeah. You, you mean the extremities or the ends, or is that the word that's used oh. in this passage? Okay. Well, it says extremities. I picture that to be like Antarctic circle region. No, right. But okay. it could be the, the ends of that uh, circuit. Um, so, or I mean the uh, ends of that, uh, placement of the of the height of that gate. Okay, I, all I'm saying it could be a poor translation. Basically, it, it so, could, yeah. And so yeah. extremities could definitely it doesn't mean the extremities of the earth. But right. I think there is another passage that says he was at the ends of the earth. So this is there could be some... in heaven at its extremities, and that just could be at the end points uh, of where those gates are in the firmament and its gotcha. layer or in its circuit. You know. That's so yeah, unfortunately, this is this is the rough part about us taking old translations and doing our best with them in modern English. You know. Yeah. Yep. If only we had access to the Aramaic, Greek, and could read those languages better. Maybe one day. One day. However, would you start here? Or did you just read the last one? Or not? You I did. think so. Yeah. yeah so I'll check this one. Enoch 75, chapter, uh, chapter 75, verse 1 through 3. And at the extremities of the earth, here it is, I beheld 12 gates open for all the winds from which they proceed and blow over the earth. Three of them are open in the front of heaven, three in the west three on the right side of heaven and three on the left. These, the first three are those which are towards the east, three are towards the north, three behind those which are upon the left, towards the south, and three on the west. <laughs> Man, that, that got a little confusing because they, they were exchanging, you know, synonymously, like west and what is it, like left? Yeah. Well, what I think he's facing north and, east, and that's why okay. he just keeps saying left. And then um, to my understanding, it seems like he's facing north. Gotcha. So 12 in total. And he says from four of them proceed winds of blessing and of health and from eight proceed winds of punishment. Hmm. Okay. It is. So I've done my best to try to illustrate that winds coming through the extremity at the extremities of the earth mm -hmm. through gates in the firmament. Yep. And this is what we talked about in episode four of the first season when we looked at Antarctica and I tried to show that clip of the Russian um, the, the Russian station down there in Antarctica that said all weather patterns of the entire earth start in Antarctica. There you go, man. I wish yeah. I had that clip. Yeah. But we did cover that. Yeah. Episode four, Antarctica yeah. ends of the earth. So that means that the, that, that would make sense with this model. 
is that all weather patterns, and that's why they put up those balloons almost uh, all the time, that like every week or more than three times a week or whatever at the uh, Russian Antarctic station, and they're told when to release the balloons because they say that when they calculate the weather, the weather patterns from Antarctica, it helps them know what to expect on the main continents. So, yep. It would yep. make perfect sense if they're coming through different portals uh, on four sides of the firmament coming into the landmass of the Earth. Yeah, if they're yeah. down there in McMurdo and the Antarctic stations are are big on being able to launch their their satellites, right? As we covered right. last season two, and satellites and satellites, they launch a lot of those from Antarctica because, as you said, the the weather patterns, the the seasonal yeah. climates changes are often dependent on the weather coming through at Antarctica. And Enoch gives us the answer for why. I right. love that. And he goes and, on. Yeah, and it makes perfect sense, too, as far as why there would be some parts, like what we're about to read here, that heat comes out of. And there are some warm areas uh, that's been talked about in Antarctica. So yeah. as you read this, you'll see where I've circled where I, you know, based on the positioning of the earth, right? The yep. re relative to where I've got it positioned, Israel, the, the promised land being at the south. And if you were to point straight up from there the north pole is in the center and so you'll see what i what i'm what i'm saying here in a minute all right sure go ahead brother oh it's your turn okay. okay the first of these winds proceeds from the gate termed the eastern through the first gate on the east which inclines southwards from this goes forth destruction drought heat and perdition from the second gate the middle one proceeds equity there issues from it rain fruitfulness health and dew and from the third gate northwards proceeds cold and drought. So what I like about these these different gates is even though they're all claimed to be on the east side right. of heaven, they each point a different way, which would be ideal thinking of it from a mechanical standpoint of like, you know, a practical purpose yeah. of what you're building. You have them angled. Basically, these these gates are angled as the wind comes yeah. through them. So Just that like a good circulation. Car, yeah. Take the vents in your car. Right. They're all on the dash and you angle them different ways. Yeah. 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 See, so it's got a good circulation going, which is would be ideal for a, a nice, you know, even tempered climate and different things to to be able to make it practical. Makes sense. And if this uh, model is correct that you've modeled here, that top gate on the right hand side in the red circle that we have on, on screen here would be the one that blows northwards cold and drought which goes over what we call antarctica mm -hmm. so it fits laterally it definitely fits i just hope that we've made that clear yeah and then from the center one if this positioning is true if destruction drought heat and perdition come through that one and if this map is somewhat accurate at least for the positioning of of australia this makes sense then too yeah because australia is mostly kind of a, a drier right um kind of warmer climate on average well, this, this is a unique map that you've chosen um because australia is really small and i know i, I yeah so I, it makes me wonder where anyway but that's that's it's right. hard that's it's right. hard to get all this correct you know? yeah it, it really is yeah this there's so many different projections and different sizing australia is one of those that's pretty much different on every map you look in yeah you look at this was from one of ken's videos okay I used his image so on the next one here would you read this one yeah, in, in Enoch 75, 68, it said, after these proceed the south winds through three principal gates. Through their first gate, which inclines eastward, proceeds a hot wind. But from the middle gate proceeds grateful odor, dew, rain, health, and life. From the third gate, which is westward, proceeds dew, rain, blight, and destruction. So this is interesting because the third gate, which is westward, it dew, rain, blight, and destruction. That, I mean... That it doesn't say uh, cold and and just in dry, and frost, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this is fascinating because all three of these, you know, the if we're looking at it from right to left with the three circles at the bottom of the image, mm -hmm. then the right would be the hot winds, and that would go up over uh, Saudi Arabia, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, India, you know, the the hot Micronesia, like Desert. that whole area, right? Yeah. Um, and then the middle would flow up over Africa, the main body of Africa, where we have extremely fertile land. Mm -hmm. And then the and then the left hand side would flow over the the left Atlantic area, basically, which produces a ton of hurricanes. So I mean, you know, it's something to consider. 
It really is. Yeah. yeah, man. I can't wait to show what the, some of the next stuff we got going on to keep in mind these, these descriptions that you have, right? Hot wind I've got highlighted that comes from the, the one that inclines East on the, on the South um, gates here. And there's, there's certain descriptions for the type of climate that comes from each one of them. And um, you know, if we look at the, the South here, we look at the East ones, we look at the North and the West, they don't, they don't all have the same descriptions, right? You would almost right. expect to see, oh, there's rain, there's hot, and there's cold coming from all of them. But it's not like that. There's specific certain ones. And what I love is that we're going to also see here shortly that every time winds are mentioned coming from a certain direction in the canon of Scripture, in the modern American 66 books, they match up with these descriptions of Enoch. That's beautiful. That's, so beautiful. I'll show that here pretty quickly. Go. Uh, this one's me. Yeah. Yeah. After these are the winds to the north, which is called the sea. And so this gives, I got to pause, this gives a new appreciation. You brought up, also I mentioned earlier that it would make sense if there was a, a body of land here in this large blank space. But I'm also getting comfortable with the idea that there might not be because okay. the north is called the sea. All right. You see how that works? That's cool. Sure. I think. So they proceed from three gates. The first gate is that which is on the east, inclining southwards. From the proceed, uh, from this proceeds dew, rain, blight, and destruction. From the middle direct gate proceeds rain, dew, life, and health. And from the third gate, which is westwards, inclining towards the south, proceeds mist, frost, snow, rain, dew, and blight. So there's that. I think in blight normally like a disease that affects plants. Yeah. What else could it mean? I'm not sure. I guess that's just part of the destruction that comes through, right? Because you got eight gates that from proceeds destruction and stuff, right? And then yeah. blessing and health come from four. And this is, of course, taking a you know hundred year old translation. I don't know how they used blight in right. that, back in the English hundred years ago, but neither. It, it did used to mean destruction on crops, mm -hmm. but that makes sense if you've got frost also and snow, you know. Um, so it just depends on, I guess, how you're using that word. But ultimately, yeah. I love I love the breakdown because if the middle gate's correct, which precedes rain, dew, life, and health, and if you look at the top down, it comes right over like the the beautiful fertile areas of the United States. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it's yeah. interesting, as well as uh, South America, Central America. So it's interesting. Yes, sir. I think this next slide is what I was just mentioning a moment ago. Like I was saying, to pay attention to these different descriptions of what comes through each gate. Um, if you go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, there's one more here. Okay. So after these, in the fourth quarter, this is Enoch 75, 10 through 12. In the fourth quarter are the winds to the west from the first gate inclining northwards proceeds dew, rain, frost, cold, snow, and chill. And from the middle gate proceeds rain, health, and blessing. And from the last gate, which proceeds southwards, proceed, uh, which is southwards, proceeds drought, destruction, scorching, and perdition. That one's specifically hot to say scorching. Yeah. Right. And the the account of the 12 gates uh, of the four quarters of heaven is ended. All right. So we're looking top down, though. Can I make a quick comment about the, the graphics we're looking at? Right. Sure. Yeah. In some of these destructions. Mm -hmm. We're looking top down. And the, the viewer may be thinking that these gates are laterally on the firmament level with the ground. But it's not maybe they're a 45 degree angle right if 90 degrees would be the center of the ferment looking down on the earth 45 degrees would be you know midway point and then 180 degrees would be a ground level but maybe we don't know does it tell us where what placement in the actual firmament that these these blowing winds are blowing onto the earth is it from a 45 degree angle is it from straight laterally you know we you know how what is that so what, I guess the zenith or the alma canter of the firmament. Yeah, there's there's different points of latitude and longitude that they have to describe yeah. the celestial sphere. Because this could make a lot. It could be a much easier lineup. I should put. I should say we could line up the effects of these portals and where these winds blow on the the different geographical regions of the Earth if they were possibly placed at a 45 degree angle, and then the vents of each three are going to to different directions. That would be very very simple. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love to see it mapped out better in a 3D model. That would be yeah, that would be and, and that way you can still have the outer ice ring, but yet you still have the vents coming down, and then their their main wind patterns are are going towards the inner circle of the Earth, 
of the landmass of the Earth and not directly pointed at the outer ice ring. So that would make a lot more sense as far as if we had a specific understanding of the placement of these vents with that are blowing winds into the Earth closed model. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. I was just doing the best I could with what little understanding and knowledge that you I did have. Great. You thank, did thank great. You. Yeah. But just for people out there that are, you know, thinking about well, how, does, how, how is the ice stayed perpetually in the ice ring of Antarctica around the flat earth if these hot winds are blowing over it, right? So maybe they're not blowing directly over it. Maybe they're blowing partially down onto it as the majority of the winds are going towards the center land masses of the, of the flat earth. I like it. Yeah. yeah. Well said, brother. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd go to the next slide, here's what I was talking about, right? So in Proverbs 25, verse 23, it says, The north wind brings forth rain. And so we did see from the northern gates, rain was one of the things, whereas rain didn't come out of all of the, all of the directions. It only came out of, uh, I want to say, two or three of them, maybe. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, it does come out of the, the north. So Proverbs lines up with Enoch there. What does Hosea say? The east wind will come, the wind of the Lord coming up from the wilderness, and his fountain will become dry and his spring will be dried up. Okay, so yet yeah, drought. And um, yet yeah, drought was one of the things mentioned from the eastern portals, gates, right? Yeah. As mm -hmm. well as Luke 12, 55, it says, and when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. <laughs> that was Yeshua <laughs> speaking in Luke there. And uh, he was... He was lining up with what Enoch says about the southern gates and the winds that come through them as well. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, and the whole concept of the rain itself, to me, like we talked about earlier with the clouds, I can't prove this, but from everything I've read in Enoch and, and, and the scriptures, um, it, it would make a lot of sense to me if the rain is just literally the waters that are up still above the firmament, you know, the waters that the firmament separated, just these gates are being opened occasionally to let in certain amounts of water that creates putting more water into the, in the terrarium basically. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's getting kind of dry because what, what is the, the bigger, yes, there's evaporation. We understand that, but not all waters evaporated. We, that's clear. And that's obvious. That's why we have standing oceans and lakes and ponds. Right. So not all waters evaporated and definitely not fast enough. Mm -hmm. So what, what becomes of water that we understand Wes it's, it goes into the water tables of the surface of the land. Yeah. The springs of the deep. There you go. Yeah. So those is it come possible? Up yeah. I'm sorry. Maybe I hope I'm not jumping ahead too much, but I'm just saying, is it possible that like we talked about earlier, the, the, the science books of our childhood only showed us the water cycle of the sky to the land. Mm -hmm. But if we looked at the creator's water cycle in an enclosed firmament where there's water encapsulating us, right. It would make perfect sense if the water that is, uh, seeping into the earth through the water tables of the earth gets recycled so that it can fall back down. And there's a constant equilibrium of being Shamaim enclosed in water. You're taking the words out of my mouth for what we're going to talk about here coming up next. Oh, sorry, yeah. brother. No, you're good. No, that's, that's good. You're good. That's a good tease because definitely I'm of the opinion that when he made floodgates and fountains or springs of the deep, they weren't for a one-time use. Right. Which is what we would have to believe if we think that those were only made for the flood. Right. I would imagine that if he's blowing winds of different temperatures constantly right. into this enclosed pressurized system, he so, has to equalize some right. some way and somehow. And which he probably means there's, has a, there's textures with the gates where they're not filled with water because those can be opened up and winds can be blown in and not spill water in. So yeah. there's there's an entire intricate, excuse me, intricate. <laughs> yeah architecturally designed layer above us to, right. to coordinate all the weather it makes so much more sense than the, than the randomness of supposedly on a spinning ball where none of the math adds up and none of the, none of this, the rays of the sun would add up to what we experience. And so, yeah, it just makes so much more sense with a wonderful proof of an actual created design that uh, oh, yeah. love and praise our creator for. That's right. Praise Romans, Romans 1, 19 through 20, right? Mm -hmm. His invisible powers and unseen nature is evident by what was made. So. Yes, sir. Bless him. Yeah. And so here's one of the things I'm most excited to show you guys. If you go to the next slide that uh, we got a little clip and this is a, a quiet a muted one. There's no sound to it. So you can play it while we're talking. OK. And this is from actual weather data mapped out. I believe this specific set of data is from 2016. It says there and then this is the winds at uh, 
700 hectare hectopascals i believe is what they the 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 measure or the unit of of measure that they use for the pressures and so if you were to go to this website um they have a an option to look at the azimuthal equidistant map and so i've i've spun it because it wasn't it wasn't positioned in the same way that i've used on these other slides where where you got the you know uh, south america off to the left and positioned like I have with the north at the top of the ocean. So, but when I spun it and when I, if you'd play it one more time, when I uh, positioned it to where what I'm saying, maybe the north in Enoch's case is the north on this, these divots show up in, in the weather data, in these wind data. Right. And I've, I've put in these little animations of like smoke or like wind blowing to kind of try to illustrate where new, new, uh, wind is being introduced into the enclosure right because right. anybody can you can you guys see that there's like actual breaks in the wind patterns right right here at northeast south and west basically it's pretty amazing and uh yeah i was blown away by that because i think that's a, a good example of how enoch could very very well be describing wow. reality in this weather weather mapped data describing what enoch describes or sh you know showing what enoch describes yeah, that's pretty amazing. I wish I had a um, man. I wish I had some good sound effects where we could just drop the bomb right now. <laughs> this is the highlights of this episode. <laughs> so yeah, this is uh, I mean, it's pretty beautiful, right? Right. If this were TikTok, it would be that that cre that creepy music. <laughs> the Stranger Things soundtrack. I th is that what it is? <laughs> it might be, yeah. it no, I don't even know. Similar. <laughs> so then basically you're sitting there going, okay, wait a minute. So top down weather patterns shows places where it looks like the weather's disrupted. Why would that be on a ball? And then specifically in this design, that would make no sense on a ball. Sure wouldn't. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. No, it should be a constant circulation because there's not even, you know, in these places where those little divots are on the edges, there's not even like land masses that would be, you know, disrupting that necessarily at each one of those points. So it does very much seem like there's an outside force <laughs> causing those those patterns. Oh, that's beautiful. Good catch, brother. Good catch. Thank you. Thank you. This is kind of a little bit irrelevant, but I thought it was it was cool when you when you lay it out like this and you put the what I'm saying is the north of where the open Pacific Ocean is. And uh, you got this the ring of fire. And if you map the ring of fire, which is a region around much of the rim of the Pacific Ocean where many volcanic eruptions and earthquakes occur, it is about 24,900 miles long up to 310 miles wide in certain sections of just volcanoes that are regularly wow. active. So this and is not Johnny Cash's ring of fire. No, no. Down, okay. down, down. Nope. So this is the actual ring of fire. I think it's interesting that they say it's almost as long as the ball earth is around, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the same length that they say are the, the circumference of the sphere that they, it, you know, it's interesting because when we build houses in the modern culture, uh, we put up, you know, um, usually when you're introducing heat into the enclosed house, it comes from floor vents because mm -hmm. heat rises. Yeah, it does. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's just interesting that you got all these volcanoes around the earth. It's true. Yeah. You know how it says that the father, you know, the, the earth is as his footstool. Yeah. I, I like to picture now that I've, I've kind of compiled this understanding of the directional terms. If he sits in, in the north of at the, the top here of this map, then he's then able to look down and see all the land masses out in front of him laid out. Okay. If he were to sit positioned, you know, if his back were facing the top of this, okay, and his front front is facing now all the the land masses. I think that's cool. And then there's this ring of fire around him. Interesting. Considering where he yeah. is, maybe you know, definitely speculation, but fun to think about. All right, all right. Um, and then you, we got an actual tide clip here. Sure, sure, yeah. So, just to kind of show. What these guys are saying causes tides. We've got a uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, world renowned so called astrophysicist. He's just an actor, but a lot of people look up to him for what he has to say about space. And what do you call him? An actor physicist? Uh, yeah, actor, actor physicist. Yeah, world nice. renowned. Nice. <laughs> Let's check out what he has this man right here, especially when it comes to science, has the answer. Okay? So, do I have an answer? Whether or not it's the answer, that's to be determined. Please, Bingo. you're ruining what I believe in. Okay? <laughs> the next thing I say, 
may be mind blowing to you. Okay. Okay. The tide doesn't actually come in and out. What? <laughs> <laughs> what happens is there is a bulge of water, two of them on opposite sides of the Earth, caused by the sun and the moon, and Earth turns inside that bulge. Uh -huh. So when this, when we say the water rises and falls tidally, what's happening is we are rotating into the bulge and then out of the bulge. So the bulge is already it's there. Already is this dude really saying that the, the land of the earth moves underneath the water and the water's being still? Ready there. And all we kind of do is pass through the pass bulge. Pass through and the water gets high and it gets low. <laughs> So we're stuck with language from our own perspective rather than language of what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. It's simpler that way to say the water goes in and out. It's simpler to say the sun set rather than Earth rotated such that our angle of view on the stationary sun fell below our local horizon. Right. Let's look at just the Earth and the moon for the moment. Okay. Okay. Which so many, people, many people think the moon is what causes it. No, the moon is two thirds of the tides. Okay. Okay. The sun is another, it's two thirds, three quarters, depends on the distance. The sun has its own tides on the Earth. Wait, in fact, the tides that the moon raises on Earth mm -hmm. are the same no matter the phase. Okay, no matter the phase of the moon, which there are some people believe that when you have a full moon, what you have is a higher tide because you have a fuller moon. Full you do have a higher tide. Oh, snap. But the tide that the moon raises on the Earth is basically the same no matter its phase. No matter its phase. What happens at full moon uh -huh. is that the sun's tides Add to the moon's tides precisely. Oh snap, we talking about a tide assist from the, the tide assist. So you have the moon, the earth, the moon will have the same tide it would at any time, right. but now it lines up with the sun. Right. They add together, you get the highest tides, tides at full moon and new moon. So now I ask you, when would you get the lost tide? Uh, when the sun is not lined up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me quantify that. So when the sun is at 90 degrees, right. the sun is pulling this, this way, way, and the moon, the moon is pulling, pulling that way, way, and the two waves right. basically cancel. Exactly. They try to cancel one another, so you have the lowest tide. It's called the neap tide. The neap? Neap. Neap tide. Neap tide. Neap tide. Neap. The side of the Earth that's closest to the moon feels a stronger gravitational pull of the moon than the, the side, side of the Earth, Earth that's farthest away. Okay? Right. The closer you are to the source of gravity, the stronger is that force. Right. Is that force. And that's true for everything. Right. There's a difference in the gravitational pull from one side to the other. Okay. Because if there's a difference, it means it's pulling this harder than that. If, if you do that, you end up stretching. Okay. So the water stretches along the line that the moon's tidal forces are pulling. Gotcha. Okay, it's a stretching force. Right. All right? And by the way, we're going to call that Earth Yoga. <laughs> So, yes. <laughs> and now, okay. downward dog. Wow. And so, and so that bulge is always there, but the sun is messing with it. Right. Okay? Exactly. So as the moon orbits the Earth, and the tidal bulge sort of tidal bulge is tracking, moving, with, moving with the moon, right. and the sun is like... Exerting its forces its force simultaneously. Simultaneously. And it either lines up or it doesn't. Wow. Okay. Go How much brain you got left to get? I don't know, man. We about this. Okay, year. so now watch. <laughs> we're only working with this to begin. <laughs> now we down to about this. Okay, so watch it now. No. So it turns out we are rotating faster than the time it takes the moon to go around the Earth. Okay? So a day is shorter than a month. Duh. So we are actually, if, if you, the viewer, are the moon, mm -hmm. and you're trying to raise this bulge. Mm -hmm. Oh, why? Okay. I am dragging the bulge ahead of you because I'm rotating faster. That's right. Okay, so so the bulge is not actually exactly aligned. No, it's over here. It's, it's, it's like that way, and like that angle. And you're pulling. So now watch. So watch. Right. Right. So it's because I'm rotating. Right. So now watch. So the moon is actually tugging on that bulge, trying to line it back up. Right. And it does that against the wishes of our rotation. Right. So the tidal bulge because of the moon, is slowing down the rotation of the Earth. So are you telling me that... That's why we have leap seconds. 
So the tides are not only responsible for what we perceive as water going in and out, it's, res it's responsible for the slowing down yeah, of the rotation of the Earth. And the Earth has been slowing down ever since the moon has existed. It's false. No way. No. Not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. <laughs> it's an appropriate comment in the, in the chat country that said marijuana is legal now so it has to be legal so that everyone can believe this <laughs> it it's just insane what we're listening to and i i don't think i could have handled him saying bulge one more time <laughs> they were really into that bulge weren't they man Ew, is... why <laughs> i had to use that jimmy fallon <laughs> This these guys, man, like the it's so funny. I mean, I guess if I was getting paid to be a propagandist like that, I would get enthusiastic and animated about it, too. But it it truly is a, a sleight of hand parlor trick so that you don't focus on what they're actually saying. Right. Because like, he concluded all that nonsense by saying the earth is slowing down in your in its, you know, circumference, circumference spin. And you're like, what? Like, that's never been measured. What? And that means that the sun in the sky, we wouldn't have 24 hour days. It means we'd have longer days, right? Right. So yeah. all of it's nonsense and unobservable. And it's just, well, of course, he also mentioned uh, leap seconds. So watch out seconds. You're, you're getting leaped over. <laughs> There's so many things. I can't even remember all the things I wish I could break down from that video, right? Before I forget, thank you, Ms. Lori, for the uh, the super chat. We appreciate you, ma'am. However, Ms. yeah, um, I, I just... I hope that I wasn't uncouth by making fun of them a little bit during my editing of that video, <laughs> but it was just so ridiculous. I had to throw in some clown faces and clown noises and <laughs> make light of it just because of how, what a travesty it is that they, they teach these things. Cause that bulge, yeah, they say that the earth, the bulge stays still basically and is and attracted towards and the earth spins through it. He said the tides don't go in and out. The earth moves through the bulge of water then how come the water doesn't go over the, <laughs> the face yeah. of the land of the dry land? <laughs> yeah. It's silliness. It just makes very little sense. Oh, However, my. yeah. Psalms 89 verse eight, uh, nine says talking to the father, the psalmist says you rule the swelling of the sea. I love that. That phrase, that turn phrase swelling of the sea. When yeah. it's waves rise, you still them. So it's just a reminder that the father is absolutely in control of all of these processes not some random happenstance based on a uh, cosmic accidental, you know, happenstance <laughs> Man, that they say. So the periodic change in, in sea level is known as a tide, which causes marine waters to rise and fall periodically. The height of the tides is directly influenced by the height above sea level and the uh, shape of the coastline and the nearby continental shelf. The presence of sloping terrain and bays gives much more range to the tides than what is seen at sea. And the defenders of the heliocentric model attribute this phenomenon to gravitational forces exerted by the moon and the sun and for which they resort to complicated explanations, ignoring that other phenomena can produce variations in sea level, too. Right. So what else did what, what was the next slide, if you would? And then one of those phenomena, just literally the the passing of the sun over the over the earth. That, that would be part of it, I would imagine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what. uh rectangle says <laughs> um you want me to read this yeah please so he says if the moon lifted up the water it is evident that near the land the water would be drawn away and low instead of at high tide caused again the velocity and path of the moon are uniformed and it follows that if she exerted any influence on the earth that influence could only be a uniform influence but the tides are not uniformed at port natal the rise and falls about six feet while at Bera. About 600 miles up the coast, the rise and fall is 26 feet. Okay, so recorded observation of the actual tides in real world reality, practical application. They don't show a uniform rising and falling of the tides as you would expect to see based on the illustration Neil deGrasse has given us. Right, with the bulge on either side of the earth, kind of a uniform bulged up in one half of the earth right the entire section having a higher tide it just does not work like that in reality and even the own their own data that like nasa will give us on the tidal amplitude right the uh the different variations of tides across the earth at different times does not reflect a uniform tide no, range not at all not in the least no but it would make a lot more sense if it was a combination of the uh, the different atmospheric pressure 
that is electromagnetically created um, gradient pressure level created by the movement of the sun and the winds that has all these different temperature gradients and make a lot I'll, more sense. I'd say that does help to be to explain part of it. However, I have a, a little bit of another theory. But okay, let's go on here. Yeah, Isaac Newton, though, in his book, had, he definitely had a theory or two, didn't he? He has a book called Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. Did you? I'm minutes. sorry. Am I supposed to pull that that slide up? You're good. Yeah, you can just leave that for you can leave the next map there for a second. Okay. Yeah, leave that there. So in 18, 1687, he wrote this book. Isaac Newton did Freemason, right? Gave an explanation for tides based on his theory of gravitational lunar attraction. Although other scientists at the time presented studies on tides from a dynamics point of view, the Newtonian explanation of the lunar influence is the one currently accepted in the mainstream consensus. Even I wish I had the quote, even Isaac Newton wasn't wasn't uh, confident, shall we say, sure. of this part of his theory. He said this was the the least, you know, the the weakest of his mm -hmm. arguments, the, this this idea that the the moon gravitational lunar attraction is what causes the tides. So but this assumption does contradict the data that they themselves expose. If the mass of the sun is 27 million times greater than that of the moon, then the gravitational pull of the sun on the Earth's oceans should be about 177 times that of the moon based on their gravitational math. So if the tides were the result of gravity, the sun would have a tidal generating force many times greater than that of the moon. But that's not what they tell us how it works, right. <laughs> even though they say the gravitational forces are the cause. Then the justification they have for this imbalance is that the sun is much farther away, you know, so its gravitational attraction is less. While on the other hand, they have no problem claiming that the sun exerts its gravitational influence system on allegedly much more distant, much more massive planets. But it's somehow too weak to have a greater influence on the Earth's ocean tides than the moon. You see this, this contradiction? Mm -hmm. yep. So according to the Newtonian gravitational theory, it would be expected that the moment of high tide occurs when the moon is exactly over some body of water. Like good old rectangle said that, you know, the, there should be the bulge in the middle of the ocean and underneath the moon as its moon lunar influence and, and that it should be lower tide at the, at the land masses, at the, at the shores. Where was I here? But in reality, it never happens this way. What's more paradoxical is the moon doesn't have any kind of gravitational influence to generate tides on large masses of fresh water, such as lakes, large rivers, ponds, or dams, even when the moon is directly above them. Okay. So fresh water, you know, you have salt water, which right. the majority of the oceans are comprised of, and then fresh five, water, which is, go ahead. Five great lakes, massive yeah. bodies of water, no tides. Can you name those great lakes? Five Superior. of them. Ontario, uh, Michigan, um, Supreme, no. Erie and Huron. Erie and Huron, thinking. that's yeah. what I was thinking. Holmes, yeah. Holmes, H-O-M-E-S. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Fun facts. However, you know, you got the, the lakes, the ponds. However, like the Great Lakes, they'll, they'll even try to say, oh, there is a tide on the Great Lakes. First of all, you don't have waves crashing on the shores of the Great Lakes. They say there's about a five centimeter tide which can right. absolutely be caused by barometric pressure. Right. Yep. The hectopascals. And or the fact. tremendous amount of uh, ship traffic. That too. Yep. Yeah. There's lots of those going through. So yeah, you put a hundred boats in there. It's going to raise the water. Okay. So where are we at now? If the moon lifted up the water, it is evident. Oh no, this is one of the, the quotes. Is this one of the next slides? Well, we, we just went over that one before you read the Newton concept. Okay. So here's a couple. No, that's all right. I think that's here's a couple different uh, maps. Now, I believe this one is from NASA. Yeah, NASA and the GSFC. Not sure what that is, I believe. But uh, that's some official tidal amplitude data, the range of, of mm -hmm. how tides seem to uh, coalesce. However, they don't reflect, like I was saying a minute ago, they don't reflect a uniform bulge. You don't see that going on here. You see separated bulges smaller bulges <laughs> i'm going to stop saying that just because they said yeah. it so much already but you see these swellings of the tides so um if you had to count let's say this zero degrees right here along the equator through the center of the image if you had to count those circles how many would you say there are if you just remove what the land masses, calling, what are you yeah, calling it's, circles? It's tough. So from right there, if if you took Africa out, 
and just looked and and imagined okay. that there's a there's so if you're saying if the title the title indicators that are color coded actually completed and made circles out of themselves just along the equator here okay how many how many different so you're looking you at see? one two three four five six maybe seven i see seven as well yeah. go to the yeah. next slide if you would okay here's oh one more oh, here's okay. just another one yeah so here's here's where i see they even have it graphed out and segmented in lines with seven portions all right so these do tend to move if you were to look at an animation they got to go up and down and swirl around but it's interesting that every time they they show you a still image of the tidal amplitude they have these these seven swellings out in the middle of the ocean and around the continents because this reminds me of what you mentioned earlier how if there's winds coming in and out there's rains waters coming through the dome from the outside of it and we still have a barometric pressure then the pressure has to be equalized in order for it to become too low pre for it to not become too low pressured or high pressured right. he's got to equalize things so he's got to move things in and out not just in things have to come out of the enclosure of the of the pressurized system to keep it equal so we're reminded as i mentioned earlier that there's floodgates in both yeah. the firmament and water found um yeah the springs of the foundations right the the fountains of the deep as they're called that's right yeah so we if we're left to imagine that these things were only designed and created just for the purpose of the flood thousands of years ago and that they were never to be used again seems impractical to make all these holes entering into the creation and from different angles without ever needing a purpose for them again so if he does need to push water in and out of the creation, then he has already set up practical gateways for this to happen. Yeah. So if he is pushing water in through the creation from the waters outside of the earth, outside of the firmament, or from the waters of the deep, <clears throat> we know he has seven by the next slide, if you would, from Jubilees. Would you read that? So the Lord opens seven floodgates of the heaven. And the mouths of the fountains of the great deep, seven mouths in number, and the floodgates began to pour down water from the heaven 40 days and 40 nights, and the fountains of the deep also sent up waters until the whole world was full of water. Okay, so he did use those specific aspects of the creation for that event. Excuse me. But I would suggest and theorize that he also uses them on a regular basis for different... To, reg to regulate the whole ecosystem of the firm. Right. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Because oh, sure. Yeah. If there's, you know, if there's any validity to the, the tidal amplitude range maps that they show in the animations that they'll, they'll give us that there does seem to be a consistent seven swellings coming up through the ocean. And it would make sense that if these waters are flowing, then those swellings would kind of move and circle around each other, but that there would always be a consistent about seven of them because that's a fountain. Nice coming up nice. through the ocean nice had you ever catch. had you ever considered that before well not with the um title overlay graphic that you use but but yes i definitely considered that uh water absolutely gets recycled throughout the earth sphere of the land that sits in water um you know in our enclosure and so i i yeah to me this would also possibly make sense well i, want, I don't want to go there but yeah so this is Good thought, brother. Good thought. Cool. Yeah. A little bit of speculation, a little bit of a uh, conjecture just based on my estimations and, and uh, you know, hypothesis from looking at what we got to look at. But uh, yeah, the there's a variety of contributing factors really that could explain tides, right? The constant flow of rivers in and out of the oceans, wind patterns, the ebb and flow of temperatures. But one of the simplest uh, explanations in the variation of the atmospheric pressure um, yeah, one of the simplest explanations is the variation of the atmospheric pressure too. Um, atmospheric pressure can vary between 990 and 1,040 hectopascals, and a change in pressure of one hectopascal can cause a compression above sea level that can cause a change of, of a one centimeter in ocean level just based on one atmospheric unit of pressure change right so yeah. the variation in sea level due to atmospheric pressure can reach up to 50 centimeters just based on the you know the um, variation and the difference of the pressure that can occur across the years so the variation yep in fact this phenomenon has even been widely studied and these variations are known as barometric tides they even 
you know, no moon necessary, no gravitational forces definitely are unnecessary because there's barometric tides that exist. So as you mentioned before, the sun and the moon in constant circuit above the earth could also be part of an electromagnetic, you know, interaction in the creation. Some may speculate and the tides that we observe could be partly generated by the effect of the two electromagnetic fields produced by the luminaries. This is possible because water is diamagnetic, right? Diamagnetism. I'm trying to say that diamagnetism is the the tendency of material to oppose the influence of an applied magnetic field, therefore be repelled by it and to oppose the influence of an, um, Oh, and it's well known that salt water is a much better conductor of electricity and is therefore affected to a much greater degree than fresh water. That's right. So this electromagnetic is required for dialectics. Yeah. There you go. So and also we can't remember the sweet and subtle influences of the constellations, according to yeah. Job. Yeah. So as I mean, who knows to what degree you want force, all three different classes of luminaries have their influence on our creation, but I I believe they truly do it according to what you're describing. Absolutely. Cool. Yep. I didn't have an illustration or much for that, but that's just another part of it. Like I say, there could be a a wide variety of contributing factors that causes the tides. We can't pin down and say just this one has to be it, but uh, we can definitely say there's a number of things. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, And they could all be working together, right? New water coming in from the flood, from the uh, fountains of the deep and the rain above. Um, how do I say this? Um, the creator knowing exactly the right amounts, right? So that the barometric pressure doesn't get too wonky, mm-hmm. right? And so I remember back in 2015, there was a, a, a famous pastor, not not too famous, but there was another pastor that uh, that was going back and forth with me about this topic about barometric pressure and the idea of the flood and the floodgates of the firmament and the water cycle. And I was explaining to him that you have to have an enclosure to have atmospheric pressure. You have to. And he was like, well, what happens in your model when you open the floodgates? What happens? All that barometric pressure would go out. And I'm like, you're assuming that the other side of the model doesn't have barometric pressure also. There you go. Like you're, you're assuming the other side is some vacuum of space. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So what if instead there's like the Bible describes the layers of heaven above are pressurized like ours. Yeah. What, what if it, they have trees and water and land and atmospheric and barometric pressure and all the things that are required for life and sustainability of life. And like, because again, we've come to this strange mindset as believers that, that this place that was created on day or that was finalized with humanity populating it on day six, that was created for five days, or I should say created for what? Yeah. Five, four days. The earth and the, yeah. Two, three, Heavens four, and, the and then five. And then on the sixth day, man was created. On the first day, man, the earth wasn't formed yet. So without form, technically, mm-hmm. until we got our enclosure to the point that he stopped making anything to do with the land and started making the animals and mankind on day six, then we're not, the earth was, you know, point, point is point being, he had already created the layers of heaven above mm-hmm. and he didn't create us in this fast. Oh, I like it. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He yeah. had already created all the levels and all the ecosystems and how things right. work with all the trees and land and mountain and water and life forms that Enoch sees in his visions that the angels show him. So it's a weird assumption that modern day Christians have to say that when they try to comprehend the multi-layered firmament model and they think, well, it, if the earth would be special and as far as nothing else in creation is like it and heaven is just full of clouds that everyone just floats around, you know what I mean? You're like, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible describes. No. So it will make a lot more sense that the father knows exactly the type of barometric pressure our enclosure needs. And he's got both wind and water and electromagnetic regulation regulators to keep it all functioning properly. Yes. So I think it's beautiful and it, it just could be why they don't let us explore this, the deep seas as easily as we do as they want us focusing on the skies above mm-hmm. and, and they want you focused on the skies above, but they don't want you to go the, the average person, can't go above what is it 60,000 feet you have to be in a military approved mission i believe it yeah yeah you have, you have to be able to afford the kind of technology that will get you you know up there and as yeah. deep as you need to to be able to study the bottom of the oceans so yeah very very well put because there would have to be pressure outside of this enclosure in order for water to have been able to shoot in right you see because you could you could reason maybe there's there doesn't need to be pressure above because the water could have just fallen 
<laughs> but if water was shooting up from the deep into you know into the earth's enclosure that would require pressure like a, that's right a fountain and that pressure is easily created with uh, not just the you know the immense um well we can move on yeah that's we, all right we've, we've definitely hit it there's a lot to say there but yeah you know, we want to get to time zones too so Sure. Yeah, I didn't think we'd be able to talk this much on, on the tide, so I've enjoyed it. Uh, in 1884, an International Prime Meridian Conference was held in Washington, D.C. to standardize time and select the Prime Meridian. The conference selected the longitude of Greenwich, England as zero degrees longitude and established the 24 time zones based on the Prime Meridian. So they, they called it GMT, right? Greenwich Mean Time was the standardized time zones now we have you is it umt universal they changed it it, it was greenwich now it's universal okay yeah but that's that's uh it it points out there that there's 24 of them yeah. right we got 24 hours in a day and so if you go to the next slide yep a time zone is a region that observes a uniform standard time for legal, commercial, and social purposes, time zones tend to follow the boundaries of countries and their subdivisions instead of strictly following longitude because it is convenient for areas in close commercial or other communication to keep the same time. That's right, yeah. And in Arizona ignores all of it and just stays <laughs> at the same time every year. They don't do daylight savings time. Do they really? I don't know that. Yeah. That's what's up. So yeah, if the, uh, let's look here, time zones, because the sun isn't 93 million miles away and 1.3 million times the size of earth like they say and it's because it circuits the heavens above in a geocentric creation rather than a heliocentric one time zones are simply the result of the sun's movement over the earth if right. the sun's complete circular revolution is 360 degrees then every 15 degree demarcation point around is one hour out of the 24 day 24 hour day right giving us 24 time zones across the circle of the earth because we call it high noon when the sun is at its highest point directly over our head which is varying and different depending where you are in relation to the sun's path on the earth you feel me so yeah if you're yeah if it's high noon in texas the sun's directly above us and you know over in california the sun is off to the east it's not directly above them yet when it's noon in texas i hear that i believe it that's the, you know only possible with the sun circling overhead as opposed to us in a in a weird tilt circling around the sun. Right. So therefore, the yeah. time zones have been created based on how it's noon wherever you are if the sun is directly above you. Except for, as you look in your map here, except for um, Saudi Arabia, uh, Omar, parts of uh, Iraq, it looks like, and Iran. Some exceptions. Um, yeah, because like you said, opening up into this through trade, commerce, and culture, they've all adopted the same time zone, regardless of how many 15 degree increments they overlap. Interesting. So I wonder what time it is like in some of those areas when the sun is directly overhead, if they still call it like what? I don't know. I'd yeah. be interested to, to hear from somebody that lives out there. I know we got a few viewers out in South Africa. And yeah, we got some, some out in Australia. Live. Do we? Yeah, UAE. Yeah. Much love to all you guys all across the plane. You could be anywhere in the whole flat world, but you are here with us tonight. And we appreciate it. Oh, we got Lisa Sevier in the comments is saying she must live in Arizona. She says we do not do. Oh, she's in Mesa, Arizona. She says we do not do daylight savings time. And daylight savings time is going away as of November 20, 2023. Uh -oh. I didn't know that. I didn't either. What? Uh, yeah, it needs to go away today. I don't want it to wait. Like, <laughs> like, I think it's stupid. I've always thought it was stupid. You're like, too I, tired of falling back and springing forward. Just I don't let like the, the sun be whatever it is. Just keep our time the same. <laughs> yeah, I don't like. I, I, it's interesting. Yeah, she does forecasting for contact centers, and they understand no more daylight savings time as of November 2023. Interesting. I had not heard of that. Yeah, you know, it, it sounds familiar. Somebody may have brought it up recently. But yeah, Greenwich Mean Time and the UTC is what it was, Coordinated Universal Time. Okay. Is what we're, we, have, we have now on average. Was that a quote? Do you want me to this next one? Yeah, read that, please. Can, can you read right. it? <laughs> yeah, this one says, uh, this is William Carpenter, 1885. He said the sun, as he travels round over the surface of the earth, brings noon to all places on the successive meridians which he crosses. 
his journey being made in a westerly direction. Places east of the sun's position have had their noon, whilst places to the west of the sun's position have still to get it. Therefore, if we travel easterly, we arrive at those parts of the earth where time is more advanced and watch in our pocket has to be put on, or maybe said to gain time. If, on the other hand, we travel westerly, we arrive at places where it is still morning, the watch has to be put back, and it may be said that we lose time. But if we travel easterly so as to cross the 180th meridian, there is a loss there of a day, which will neutralize the gain of a whole circ circumnavigation. And if we travel westerly the cross the same and cross the same meridian, we experience the gain of a day, which will compensate for the loss during a complete circumnavigation in that direction. The fact of losing or gaining time and sand around the world, then, instead of being evidence of the Earth's rotundity, as it is imagined to be, is, in its practical exemplification, an everlasting proof that the Earth is not a globe. Thank you, William Carpenter. Again, from 100 proofs that the Earth is not a globe, that was proof number 100, the last nice. one that he had. And our last piece of, uh, you know, fun facts from history, that's from 1885. There's been lots of guys that have been recognizing. And what I love is that all of these characters all of these authors that we've quoted from that wrote these books that are fairly popular in the in the uh, biblical cosmology communities that we have these different books get passed around this is one of the popular ones all of these guys wrote from a biblical worldview from a standpoint that the bible was true i love that because some of the people that use these authors don't believe the bible even though all of these authors do yeah it would be fascinating to talk with a guy like this 120 30 years ago i know yep they were on to some stuff so here is not only the seasons depicted as you got the tropics color coordinated, right? Um, as well as time zones, because if you look at the face of the earth like this and consider that the movement of the sun is almost like a 24 hour clock hand, right? You also right. have the analemma on the same, the same image. So I enjoyed whoever made this. It might've been the Ashley Webster chick that, that made all the maps because yeah, she made a lot of stuff like this, nice. but uh, yeah, you also have the compass turning right pointing north on the outer edge and so everything kind of wrapped up into one image here that's yeah, a good multi-layer graphic nice check it out so do you remember there in uh the tides video that we watched with neil degrasse tyson and he yeah. was talking about how the days are slowing down because earth's tides are causing it to slow down in rotation so i so should getting a longer days pardon me longer days i should just take whatever he says and do the opposite right <laughs> pretty much that's just about the, the case in every every time okay because we have quite a few verses here would you read the first one sure first in our chapter 80 verse 2 in the days of sinners the years shall be shortened and their seed shall be tardy on the lands and fields and all things on the earth shall alter and shall not appear in their time and the rain shall be kept back and the heaven shall withhold it Okay, so this is a prophecy for the end times, right? I don't I don't have a exact time period of where in like the tribulation period or around what trumpet or when exactly these things will start to happen. But a lot of people might would say we've mentioned on the show before that a lot of people have this feeling like time seems to be speeding up a little bit. A lot of people just say that happens when you get older, right? <laughs> just it seems to go by faster. But what if how would it practically happen? I think we've mentioned it, talked about it a couple of times. However, Baruch, right, the, the prophet and, and priest and scribe, also scribe of Jeremiah, also had something similar to say about it that, that Enoch, you know, reiterated. So to Baruch 20, verse one, therefore, behold, the days come and the times shall hasten more than the former and the seasons shall speed on more than those that are past and the years shall pass more quickly than the present years. Sounds like shorter days rather than longer days. That does. It and does. we know the earth doesn't spin, but if it did, it would be spinning <laughs> faster, not slower. <laughs> but it doesn't. The earth is stationary, immovable, at rest, pillars, foundations, all these yeah. things. And, and apparently the Messiah spoke on these concepts in, in Mark 13. And maybe this is what he meant. Yeah, go ahead. It says, unless the Lord had shortened those days, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. That so. Is Go ahead. Just, just for the sake of the entire context of Mark 13, that I would place the days of sinners um, and what this means as far as uh, the great apostasy or the great falling away or the, you know, the thing that Paul also mentions where the lawless one would be revealed, that kind the of reign of the beast. I would say it's the 42 months leading up to the return of Yeshua 
where he goes out to persecute the saints of the whole earth and conquer kingdoms and nations. So it would make a lot of sense if the father's like, let me just push my finger on the hour command <laughs> and just speed up this time period a little bit. I love um, it. He you know gets I mean? 42 months, but God's going to be like, oh, let's make it like 37, maybe. <laughs> well, hey, it's if, if we're still counting days by the revolution of the sun overhead, yeah, he's still a revolution of the sun. Right. Just happening faster than was normal because he's like, yeah, I'll give you 42 months. It just won't be the same length of, you know, this, it just, I'll make them go by quicker. Basically it's, it seems very interesting. I'm almost, uh, interestingly merciful. Yeah. Yeah. Very graceful. Yeah. That is another example of his, his mercy and grace for sure, because it's going to be a tough time. Yeah. You know, yeah. we covered last season, episode 21, I think the beast of the bottomless pit, we covered how he comes out at the fifth trumpet and there's only, we can then deduce that since he only gets 42 months of a reign, and Yeshua comes back at the seventh trumpet to wipe him out, then there's 42 months between the fifth trumpet and the seventh trumpet. And as we, far as we could tell, there's that's the only time qualifier we get for the length of yeah. the time between the trumpets, really. It's just between the fifth and seventh. There's 42 months, three and a half years. But uh, if, yeah, if what you're saying based on the context of when Yeshua was saying those things about the days being shortened, then uh, that'll be that period of time when he's going to start speeding some stuff up, make the time go by faster for the sake of the elect. And we love him for it. It's amazing. And to, to the uh, gentleman in the uh, woman or gentleman in the audience that is uh, asking us if they, there were incontrovertible proof, the earth was round, would it change our faith? I would lovingly turn the question back on you since we already used to believe the world is round and never saw incontrovertible proof. Therefore, we had to actually apply the proof that was evident to us, which matches the scripture. I would ask you, would it change your faith if the words of scripture, as plainly stated, that we live in a dome enclosed creation, would that change your faith? Would it increase it? Because to answer her question, yeah, it would, for me, it would mean that the definitions of the words used in scripture are, are not how we define the words, right? The definitions are incorrect because... Yeah, consistently, repeatedly, hundreds and hundreds of verses from Genesis to Revelation and all of the corroborating books that were included in canons from around the world. The verbiage, the, the language used to describe creation is consistent. And if we just go by the definitions of those words, then we get something much different than a heliocentric spinning ball shooting through space. Whereas, you know, so yeah, it would, it would change my faith in the sense of I'd have to reexamine how these words are defined. Otherwise... Um, if how it would change your faith is that you would then feel closer to the creator and recognize that he's created all this for you and that he physically exists in a location directly above us instead of in some infinite outer space and who knows where in another galaxy, but yeah. that it's all created for us to exist and that this is all that there is and everything in the heaven circles around overhead. So many good things. And it means yeah. his word is true and can be trusted. Yeah, I was just about to say, even from a philosophical fundamental level of looking at the claims of the scriptures that were created and all of the other things inside of the scriptures that can be proven to be true that have nothing to do with the observable shape of creation, right? Like how to love your neighbor, how to interact with people that, you know, all the things that are involved in the scriptures that the shape of creation is intertwined into those texts. All the other things are also provably true, demonstrably true, repeatedly true over and over again. So it leads me to believe that the entirety of his word is truth, as Psalm 119, uh, 142 explains, right? And so therefore, I would want to say that I believe the statement that God is not a liar like men are, like men lie, right? So the men who tell us the world's round, you're not created, you're an accident, spinning aimlessly through space, an insignificant part of the galaxy and an insignificant rock that's destined for a heat death when your sun goes supernova, those people are liars. That's and right. They've been proven to be liars. So what would why would i believe what they claim to be incontrovertible proof they've never shown it once my my creator has shown it over and over again incontrovertible proof that we live in a place exactly as he described flat stationary on pillars with a dome enclosed so yeah. to me it's just like it's not even a it really boils down to peer pressure wes is when i see folks that are still hang on to the narrative, you know, especially, and you know, who knows if, if, how many people in the audience come and go, how many watches faithfully, you know what I'm saying? Who knows? But we know that there's a lot of believers out there that have, that have had this topic um, introduced to them yeah. and they still choose like the pastor I was mentioning in the conversation earlier. I mean, he's, 
he was going to do a debate with me one time, but then he backed out. Ah. And if I, I'm not going to drop his name because everybody would know who this guy is, and, and okay. they would be like they would be bombarding him with with emails trying to get that debate to happen. But basically, he backed out. But the whole point was like he was he was emphatically introduced to this biblical cosmology by people in his peer circle mm-hmm. who started to realize the truth of the scriptures and the definitions of the words were consistent, right? And he and then he went on a full on like tirade against it to the point where calling people heretics and not of the faith and deceivers and, mm. and it got really ugly and it was like man it's got to be peer pressure it's i mean i obviously believe there's a spiritual influence to the deception we all know that deception comes from negative spiritual influence but as far as like when you have someone that is a bible scholar and he looks directly at the words and then he says well i know what they say but i'm going to reinterpret them immediately because it's just stupid. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. You're like even well, if the pressure only comes from when they go to to do some research, so called, and they turn well, to cult institutions that reaffirm what they've already been told. Uh, and sometimes financial pressure. If he doesn't think his his congregation would still follow him if he started talking like this, you know. Um, so there's a lot of pressure that I think a lot of believers face. It far really, I guess what I'm trying to say is this topic, Wes, is truly. It's truly a refining fire, if I could put it like that, for how will you be able to face under persecution from close loved ones, friends, and fam- and fellow members of the faith? Because to stand up for the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a test of your own hermeneutic confidence that you can mm-hmm. look at the scriptures and go, okay, logically, this says this, and it's, right. it's you know reaffirmed and, and by all these other statements, and this is what the words mean. This is the definition of the words. So then you have to like trust, okay, that's a very common sense hermeneutic approach, right? We believe what it says and look up what the words mean. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of modern-day Christianity that teaches you to instantly reinterpret it according to right. another lens. That it's got to be metaphoric or symbolic yeah. for something other than what it says, which Poetic is dangerous. language, yeah. right? Suddenly poetry means it doesn't mean what it says. I'm like, You're... what poem has ever described something it wasn't trying to talk about? Like, <laughs> does it? Anyway, so I, not to belabor it too much, but just, you know, I, I, I'm really appreciative that we are still possibly reaching people that are on the fence about this topic, right? Because we're we're not preaching to the choir. We know there's a ton of people that watch these videos who who've heard it talked about, but very surface level. Right. No pun, no pun intended. But <laughs> We, we try to go in deep. That was our heart. That was Wes and I's passion was like, all right, this topic has come up a lot. There's a lot of argument about it, but no one's really breaking down all the stuff biblically mixed with the science and observation and everything. So this is why we're here. Thanks for watching and uh, keep watching. That's right. Yeah, because next week we are going to have a guest. Surprise guest will come on and we're also going to check out. Uh, let's see. Let's uh, go ahead and announce another giveaway. OK, you want to? Let's uh, next week. Okay. Let's I, do the. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, sounds great to me. Yeah. Next week, let's go ahead and choose a uh, a winner from the giveaway. Um, and actually, let's go ahead and do. Let's we'll pick one from the Patreon. So if you guys have not already set up with the Patreon, here's another reminder that we have that available option for you guys to contribute and support what we do. Because when you don't support it, things can go away. And uh, we love you. We want to keep doing this for you, and we want to keep getting better at it. And then, so there's one for the Patreon members. That'll be a certain giveaway that we'll announce next week. Yeah, let's go ahead. Next week, we'll announce what the giveaway is going to be. And then <clears throat> then also, there will be one for people to leave in the comments. We'll talk about it all then. But yeah, we'll announce a giveaway next week. And we'll show you guys what we'll have in store for you. And we'll we'll make it available for people who are, are able to do the Patreon and others who aren't as well. Cool, brother. We'll have some fun with it. And then, uh, yeah, musical guests. We're going to have an update for the Firmament Project. Our brother Nick has been hard at work. He's got some more stuff cool that's uh, coming down the pipelines for that project. So we'll show you all some video on it. What else, brother? You got anything else to say to the people before we let them go? I don't think so. I think maybe next week, uh, Uncommon Ground is going to have an actual company sponsor, maybe. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Could be, yeah. could be amazing. I look, I look forward to talking about that. That'll be a good show, too. Yeah. Cool. Cool beans, bro. Yeah, so we'll work all that out. We look forward to seeing everybody. Guys, check out the links in the description. Subscribe to this channel. Like the video. Share it to your social medias. Help us get past the suppression of the truth that the the corporations enforce on us and the algorithms that they they put into place to try to bury things like this. Because I feel like we talked about a lot of really Mm eye-opening things, right? We covered some details with some observations that really lined up with some scripture, didn't it? Yeah, for sure. I can't remind me. Did you have fresh new music to drop tonight? 
Not a fresh new one, no, but I had, I did okay. have a, an outro song. Okay. I yeah, can't remember if that was original or not. No, no, this is ODD TV. He's uh, got a song called the, the Whole Truth. I want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So we'll leave you guys out on that one tonight. We say shalom to you from under the seven domes. We ask that you bless God and may he bless you. And we love you all. See you next week. See you guys. See you next Much time. Love. Thanks, Sean. Oh, here we go. You know, I really understand sometimes what a terrible burden it is to know some of the things that I know. To try to wake people up and impart this knowledge to them. And find out that they just have walls built in front of them. They want to be slaves. Now I risk sounding like a conspiracy theorist, but it's no longer a theory. What I'm about to say is fact. The secret organizations of the world power elite are no longer secret. They have planned and are now leading us into a one world communist government. journey with me deep inside the rabbit hole wake up my friends there's some things that you have to know everything you ever thought you knew it has to go for instance nasa is the world's largest magic show 9-11 was a planned demolition and sandy hook was a scam come on man are you tripping constant programming being crammed in your vision just take a step back and examine this prison turn on the news and they're trying to blind you all they ever do is tell you lies and divide you there's nowhere you can even hide they'll find you illuminati all seeing eyes right behind you it's about time you find out we're being lied to they're attempting to control the mind that's inside you hide you from the power that designed you does anybody have a problem with this well i do i want the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth they say they got it but they're never coming up with proof if you're looking then they got you jumping through these hoops the lies always continuing to rise and busting through the roof i want the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth they say they got it but they're never coming up with proof if you're looking then they got you jumping through these hoops the lies always continuing to rise and busting through the roof they're lying to us about everything how can this be i know i'm not crazy and yet i'm questioning my sanity i see what the illuminati's doing to humanity the truth is stranger than fiction we're living in a fantasy what i'm witnessing is unreal it's a one-way battle for us cattle going uphill if we don't stand and fight now then no one will our children will never know freedom it's a done deal the future's not looking so promising it's the poor who go to war while the rich keep on profiting it's us that they're slaughtering and money that they're honoring and soon it's gonna be the new world order that they're offering it's mind-boggling how so many don't seem aware and if they are it's like they really just don't even care our world is broken and i'm hoping it can be repaired but we'll have to fight for it so just be prepared i want the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth they say they got it but they're never coming up with proof if you're looking then they got you jumping through these hoops the lies always continuing to rise and busting through the roof i want the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth they say they got it but they're never coming Coming up with proof. If you're looking, then they got you jumping through these hoops. The lies always continuing to rise and busting through the roof. Forget the politicians. Politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. 